Good. Nice Good. To it's going to be, you know, I think we'll probably go to about 6, 7 p.m. back. What? Good, <laughs> The Judiciary Committee will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare recesses of the Committee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on hate crimes and the rise of white nationalism. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. Today, the Judiciary Committee will hold a hearing that I wish we did not have to conduct, but which is sadly necessary to examine an urgent crisis in our country. We will consider issues relating to hate crimes and the rise of white nationalism. This topic goes to the heart of our country's long-standing struggle to carry out what the preamble to our Constitution says it is designed to do, to form a, a more perfect union. Hate incidents target victims based on their actual or perceived race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, or other immutable characteristics. Some of these incidents may be crimes, and some are not. But all of them harm not only individuals, but also our communities, and ultimately, our entire nation. Unfortunately, various statistics confirm what most of us have observed, that hate incidents are increasing in the United States. Although reporting of hate crimes to the FBI by the states is woefully incomplete, what we do know is that these statistics have been on the rise in recent years, with hate crimes surging 20% last year, and the plurality of these crimes, 29%, being motivated by anti-black bias. The American public can sense this reality. A poll conducted by the Communities Against Hate Initiative showed that 84% of individuals believe that hate incidents are very or somewhat prevalent in this country, and 66% believe that such incidents or, or expressions of hate are growing worse. This increase has occurred during a disturbing rise of white nationalism in our country and across the globe. The deadly 2017 Unite, Unite the Right White Nationalist Rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, served as a frightening reminder of the threat white nationalism and hate groups pose to the United States. In just the last few years, the ideology of white supremacy has inspired terrorist attacks on all the Abrahamic religions. In 2015, nine worshipers were murdered at the Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston. In 2018, 11 people were killed at the Tree of Life Eitz Chaim Synagogue in B Pittsburgh. And this year, 50 people were slaughtered at the Al-Nur Mosque and Linwood Islamic Center in Christchurch, New Zealand. In each case, the perpetrators were motivated by a belief that people perceived to be non-white, whether they be African Americans, Jews, Muslims, or members of other minority communities, were plotting to undermine the white race as part of a great replacement the same idea that motivated the 2011 Norwegian attacks on a Workers' Youth League summer camp, which cost 77 lives, and the attack on a Sikh temple in Milwaukee that cost six lives. In the age of instant communication with worldwide reach, white nationalist groups target communities of color and religious minorities through social media platforms, some of which are well known to all Americans, and some of which operate in hidden corners of the web. These platforms are utilized as conduits to spread vitriolic hate messages into every home and country. Efforts by media companies to counter this surge have fallen short, and social network platforms continue to be used as ready avenues to spread dangerous white nationalist speech. As the New Zealand attack showed, some hateful ideological rhetoric that originates in the United States is now used to inspire terror worldwide. Unfortunately, in a time when decisive leadership is needed, the president's rhetoric fans the flames with language that, whether intentional or not, may motivate and embolden white supremacist movements. We only, need look, we only need to look at the perpetrators of violence and hate to see the impact this rhetoric has had. For example, the New Zealand shooter declared that he supports President Trump, quote, as a symbol of renewed white identity and common purpose, close quote. Congress in recent years, has also failed to take seriously the threat that white nationalism and hate crimes pose. Last Congress, we did not even hold hearings after the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally or after the Tree of Life synagogue shooting. And now we see witnesses invited by the minority who openly associate with purveyors of hate. White nationalism and its proliferation online have real consequences. Americans have died because of it. 
I did not call this hearing so that some may promote the very messages we need to combat. We must together rebuke those who seek to divide us through a message of hate. Although we will examine the federal government's response in more detail in the future, I will say now that it appears that federal law enforcement agencies have not taken the deadly and increasing dangers posed by white nationalist hate groups as seriously as foreign terrorist threats. The Center for Investigative Reporting analyzed incidents of domestic terrorism occurring from January 2008 to December 2016. It found that there were nearly twice as many attacks perpetrated or attempted by right-wing extremists, 115, compared to those identified as Islamist domestic terrorism, 63. The report also concluded that right-wing extremist attacks were more often deadly. Although the total number of deaths associated with Islamist incidents was higher, 90, this is largely due to the 2009 mass shooting at Fort Hood in Texas, which alone resulted in 13 deaths. In fact, only 13% of Islamist cases caused fatalities. By contrast, nearly a third of attacks committed by right-wing extremists involved fatalities, 79 deaths. These figures highlight the risks we face if we ignore the threats posed by white nationalist movements. To help us better understand the nature of these threats to our communities and the ways in which social media has been used to spread hate and incite violence, we have a diverse panel of witnesses before us today. I trust that our frank discussion of these issues will help the committee and the public better understand the challenges we face and how we may best respond. It is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity uh, for us to again condemn white nationalism. It is an opportunity that's unfortunate, but it is not unimportant in this hearing. This ideology lies in an immeasurable yet equal value of every person. We, are, we saw those lies take root in the attacker who murdered Heather Heyer and injured others in Charlottesville. The attacker's medical record shows he was ill, his mind was sick, but his heart was sick as well. I join every American who denounces hatred and violence wholesale. My Republican colleagues unanimously supported the resolution rejecting white nationalism and white supremacy this January. And we took action when the words of one of our colleagues ran counter to our values. American values share nothing ideologically with white nationalism. Nothing white supremacists claim resonate with any of us here today. And I appreciate the chance to consider how to combat the violence associated with this terrible ideology. Too often we have seen white nationalism and other notions of racial, ethnic, and cultural superiority end in violence, both at the individual and national level. Hatred and racial superiority continue to play out in Western China where the Uyghurs are being detained in re-education camps and killed, and it has run rampant in Iraq where ISIS fighters have murdered and enslaved thousands of Yazidis. Over and over again, history has warned us racism and hate mobilize people for violence and oppression. Why haven't we learned these lessons? Why haven't we hewed more closely to the ideal that all men are created equal and other bedrock principles of our nation? The practical problem is our hearts run quickly to hate. We hunt for em embrace uh, any data suggesting we are better than our neighbors. Are we more talented? Are we better looking? Are we more enlightened? Most importantly, do we have friends who agree our in-group is superior to an out-group? We remember today, hate always makes its nest in pridefulness. So when we examine the foundations of white supremacy, we realize the primary difference between white nationalist violence in America and ethnic cleansing or communist internment camps is scale, not substance. I think people with political campaign experience have witnessed firsthand how quickly people's heart become hate factories. With that in mind, I hope we will use this hearing to pursue softer hearts and intellectual integrity. And with that, I am glad to have our witnesses here who will share their values, just as I am glad to have all the uh, Democratic witnesses here to share from their heart. And I think that's what makes us better people without distractions of the headlines and the banners. With that in mind, as we move forward, I worry that the true rep motivation for this hearing is to suggest that Republicans are hateful and dishonest and somehow connected to those characters who truly spew hatred and act on it in the public square. As we all know, however, House Republicans led the chamber's unequivocal rejection of white nationalism. To those who say we could have been clearer sooner, I hear you. We can't afford to let racial hatred build a home in our nation's capital, which is why it is also so unfortunate the rise that has seemingly taken fruit lately of anti-Semitism in this same body. When we're holding this hearing, it is interesting to note that white nationalism traffics in anti-Semitism. We also know that anti-Semitic violence has extinguished countless lives. What I don't know is why the tolerance for Jewish stereotypes has been spilling over in the members in this body. Moreover, I don't know why it is from the majority finds it so hard to condemn such hateful language. 
According to the Anti-Defamation League, the anti-Semitic violence has increased 57% in 2017. So I hope that my friends will use this hearing to outline their plan to condemn anti-Semitism along with the cornerstone, which is a cornerstone of the white nationalist ideology in this house. People of every ethnic and religious background come to America because our republic affords them the liberty and safety unavailable in many corners of the globe. This com country is committed to free thought, free expression, free press, and a blind justice system. This very things that foster diversity and deter intellectual bankrupt ideologies like white nationalism. When the marketplace of ideas remains wide open, it's easy to comparison shop, to identify to re and reject hollow, hateful worldviews. When justice is swift and blind, violence and abuse will not pay off. When power is shared among all citizens, authorities are less likely to oppress the people they are meant to serve. In contrast, governments that attempt to restrain people's hearts and minds for whatever reason pave the way to oppression and political violence. Americans have always understood these dynamics. Sadly, identity politics has divided us, and we have forgotten our core political identity. Americans fundamentally recognize each of us have been endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights and is individual responsible for their actions. In other words, our unity as a nation depends not on ethnic uniformity, but on our equality as citizens. White nationalism denies this, and I sit here today rejecting hate and violence of any kind. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I will now introduce to the, today's witnesses. Eileen Hershenov <coughs> is the Senior Vice President of Policy for the Anti-Defamation League. Prior to joining the ADL, she served as general counsel and head of public policy for the Wikimedia Foundation. She earned her BA from Yale College and her JD from Yale Law School. Dr. Mohammed Abu Salha is a medical professional from North Carolina. Before moving to the United States, he worked as a general practitioner in Iraq, Kuwait, and Jordan. Dr. Abu Salha attended Eastern Virginia Medical School for a degree in psychiatry and his residency. Eva Patterson is the president and co-founder of the Equal Justice Society. Her long career of anti-discrimination work includes 26 years with the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, 13 of them as executive director, co-founding and chairing the California Civil Rights Coalition for 18 years, and serving as the vice president of the ACLU National Board for eight years. She received her JD from UC Berkeley's School of Law. Neil Potts currently serves as the public policy director for Facebook, who oversees the development and implementation of Facebook's community standards. <coughs> Mr. Potts graduated from the United States Naval Academy and the University of Virginia Law School. Prior to joining Facebook, he worked as a ground intelligence officer in the U.S. Marine Corps. Alexandria Walden is a public policy and government relations counsel for Google. She also represents Google at the Global Network Initiative. Prior to joining Google, Ms. Walden has worked at the Rabin Group, the Center for American Progress, and the now Legal Defense and Education Fund. Mort Klein is national president of the Zionist Organization of America. He has served as a lecturer at Temple University and as a biostatistician at UCLA School of Public Health and the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine. Candace Owens is an American commentator and political activist. She currently serves as the Director of Communications for the Advocacy Group, Turning Point USA. Kristen Clark currently serves as the President and Executive Director of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. Previously, she has worked with the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund and at the U.S. Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division. She earned her A.B. from Harvard and her J.D. from Columbia Law School, which is in my district. <laughs> I have to put that out. We welcome all of our distinguished witnesses and thank them for participating in today's hearing. Now, if, it please, if you would please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. And raise your right hand, please. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and beliefs to help you God? Let the record show the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you will have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals the five minutes have expired. Ms. Hershenov, you may begin. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Collins, <coughs> and member of the, members of the committee, good morning. I'm Eileen Hershenov, 
Senior Vice President for Policy at ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. Please let me first say thank you for your leadership in recognizing the importance of addressing the increase in hate crimes and resurgence of white supremacy. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss topics my colleagues and I are focused on every day. Second, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists for their perspectives today, especially Dr. Abu Saha. Thank you for bravely sharing the painful story of your daughter's murder. Such horrific crimes affect entire communities, but I know they affect the families most of all, and I am so sorry for your loss. Since our founding in 1913, ADL's mission has been to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. ADL is one of the foremost non-governmental authorities on domestic terrorism, extremism, hate groups, and hate crimes. For many decades, we have been tracking white supremacists and other extremists, and we have been developing strategies to address these threats. In 1985, we issued a report on how white supremacists communicated on dial-up com computer bulletin boards, and we have been working to combat the spread of hate and extremism online ever since, including partnering with the tech industry. <coughs> you have my full testimony, but allow me to highlight a few points for you. White supremacists in the United States have experienced a resurgence in the past three years, driven in large part by the rise of the alt-right. There is also a clear corollary, as our research shows, to the rise in polarizing and hateful rhetoric on the part of candidates and elected leaders. This is a particularly dangerous problem. White supremacists have been responsible for more than half, 54% of all domestic extremist-related murders in the past 10 years. And in the last year, that figure has risen to 78% of all extremist-related murders. That is, white supremacists were responsible for more than three quarters of all domestic extremist murders in 2018. So there is a crucial need for this hearing, focusing on white nationalism. Not because other types of extremism aren't dangerous, but because we as a society our laws, and our elected leaders have not focused sufficiently on the rising threat of white supremacy. The other driving force for the resurgence of white supremacy is the role of social media in enabling this hate to spread. Just this morning, ADL issued a new report documenting how before carrying out the hateful murders in Pittsburgh and New Zealand, the alleged white supremacist gunmen frequented fringe social networking sites like Gab and 8chan that act as echo chambers for the most virulent anti-Semitism and racism and act as, acting, as active recruiting grounds for potential terrorists. These platforms are like round-the-clock digital white supremacist rallies creating online communities that amplify their vitriolic fantasies. As you craft policy responses to these complex challenges, we believe they must include revitalizing the federal government's attention to domestic terrorism, and in particular, right-wing extremist violence, incentivizing state and local law enforcement agencies to more comprehensively collect and report hate crimes data to the FBI, strengthening laws against perpetrators of online hate, helping to ensure that social media platforms act against hate and increase transparency in ways they are not now doing, and improving law enforcement training for responding to hate online and off. I have submitted detailed recommendations for the tech industry, which are included in my written testimony. Finally, I implore you and all public leaders to consistently call out bigotry and extremism at every opportunity. We all have a responsibility to make clear that America is no place for hate. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Dr. Abu Saha. Morning, Mr. Chairman, 
esteemed members of Congress and ladies and gentlemen, February 10, 2015, that was the day our lives cha changed forever when my two daughters, Yusuf and Razan, and my son-in-law, Dia, were shot to death execution style in Yusuf and Dia's home in Chapel Hill. When we arrived at the scene, yellow tape and flashing lights froze the blood in our veins. We had waited almost six hours before police officers confirmed that Dia, Rizvan, and Razan were all, had all been shot to death. In a desperate attempt to make it bearable, an officer whispered, and I quote, they didn't suffer, it was, one, it was swift, it was one shot to the back of the head. Well, his statement did not make it any bearable, any more bearable than nothing did. News about their death spread all over the internet and media, over the globe. But we never heard in the media that the murderer hated them. Trouble began when this man observed my two daughters appearing on the scene, adorned with their hijabs. I remember my user telling me that this condescending man told her he hated how she looked and dressed. He made it very clear to my children that they were not welcome in their own neighborhood. I must be one of a few physicians, if not the only one who read his own children's murder autopsy reports in details. They are seared into my memory. Bullets macerated Yusuf and Razan's brains. Dia took many bullets to the arms and chest before he fell down to the ground. And after that, the murderer saw that he was still breathing and shot him again in the mouth. The last time we saw them in their coffins, Yusuf's forehead was bulging and her hazel eyes had turned gray and lifeless. It was once Razan's warm and smiling face filled with life was now lifeless, stone cold, and deadly pale. Dia's face lacked expression, and he had a broken tooth from that final shot to the mouth. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify before you, but I want you to remember more than their deaths. I want you to know who they were and what we have lost. Yusur was a vibrant 21-year-old woman who always found ways to give to others in every aspect of her life from volunteering at a dental clinic for Syrian refugees in Turkey, to feeding the homeless in downtown Raleigh and building houses for Habitat for Humanity. She graduated from NC State University and was accepted at UNC Schools of Dentistry to be with the love of her life, Dia. Razan was 19 years old and was so full of life. She was a gentle soul, generous giver, talented artist, a photographer, Razan was a freshman at NC State University's School of Design and aspired to be an architect. During her freshman year, she mentored, a new, she mentored and taught youth, and she led Project Downtown, feeding the homeless in Raleigh and Durham with meals tagged with inspirational and personalized notes, she wrote. My wife and I raised them to be Muslim Americans, proud of their country and their community as Muslim as apple pie. I'm sorry, as American as apple pie. That can be Muslim too. <laughs> My son-in-law, Dia Barakat, was a smart and kind young man who was studying dentistry at UNC Chapel Hill. Dia was an avid basketball fan, but not of Duke. <laughs> I was so proud of his hometown. Dia was a compassionate, caring individual who spent much of his time giving back to those in need including uh, getting free dental supplies to the homeless. Although Yusur and Dia were only married for six, years, for six weeks, so six short weeks before they were murdered, those were the happiest days of our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, what happened to our children was a home invasion and execution. Three beautiful young Americans were brutally murdered, and there's no question in our minds that this tragedy was born of bigotry and hate. This has happened to, on too many occasions. Families like mine, regular Americans living regular lives, are left without hope that justice will truly be served. Our families were fortunate to have Muslim advocates and other lawyers supporting us every step of the way, but not everyone is so lucky. I am afraid for our country. In 2016, the FBI recorded a 67% increase in anti-Muslim hate crimes. And just, a week ago, just weeks ago, a young man in Indiana was shot in the back of the head by a man shouting anti-Muslim slurs. And we miss our children so much. At times, the pain is just as sharp now as it was when they died. And I ask you, I truly plead to you, not to let another American family go through this 
because our government would not act to protect all Americans. Please remember them, Yusur, Dia, and Razan. They are my children, and they are gone. I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Patterson. I'm so sorry. Um, Chairman Nadler, Vice Chair Stanton. Uh, it's a great honor to be at this hearing. I'm president of the Equal Justice Society. We're an organization that is transforming the nation's con Oh, Ranking Member Collins, I didn't see you, sorry. Um, we're transforming the nation's consciousness on race through law, social science, and the arts. We often watch these hearings and are really rather startled at the rancor that goes on between the parties. So I have a favor to ask of the Democrats and the Republicans here today. But first, a brief moment of silence for his children and all the victims of hate crimes. For the next five minutes, I would like you all to give me the benefit of the doubt. I want you to listen as Americans and not as partisan enemies. I come in peace, truly. Rather than list my credentials, I want to tell you who I am. I was born in your state, Representatives Jackson, Lee, Escobar, uh, Garcia, and Goldman. I'm a Texan from San Antonio, Texas. My father was in the Air Force and served in Vietnam. I went to desegregated military schools in England, France, and Illinois. I am a Christian. I have been a civil rights lawyer for, 50, for 44 years. Some of the things I'm going to share with you are difficult to hear, but they are facts. In August 1619, 400 years ago, 20 enslaved Africans landed at Jamestown. In order to sell, rape, and beat these Africans, white Americans, and I know none of you own slaves, had to see us as less than human. Thomas Jefferson said the following about me and my ancestors. They have no tenderness and love. They are intellectually inferior. They are physically unattractive. Thus began a narrative, says law professor Shauna Marshall, that black people were only good for physical labor, we were inhuman and violent. This was a narrative necessary in order to justify slavery. White supremacy has been a feature of the mistreatment of Native Americans for years, and it was applied to Africans once we arrived here. From the beginning of our country's inception through the Constitution, the Founding Fathers knowingly and consciously embraced slavery and white supremacy. Politics, including the three branches of government, have played and continue to play a role in the perpetuation of white supremacy and the continued mistreatment of black people, either through action or inaction. In 1857, the Supreme Court in the Dred Scott decision reinforced white supremacy by saying black people have no rights that white people need respect. Ultimately, slavery ended, the Reconstruction era happened, black men could vote, and then politics reared its ugly head once again. Federal troops were withdrawn from the South in order to uh, place Rutherford B. Hayes on the in the presidency, and the reign of terror in the South began. Once again, I'm, a, I'm a, a Southerner. The Ku Klux Klan came about. They were white supremacists. They lynched people. They made sure that black people could not vote. For years, the NAACP asked Congress to act on anti-lynching laws. Congress refused to act. Fast forward to 1964, our fellow Texan got the Civil Rights Act passed, but when it passed, he said, we have lost the South for a generation, he said, of Democrats. Six years later, the Southern strategy was devised to encourage white people to abandon the Democratic Party and vote for the GOP. It was a shrewd and effective political strategy, but it drove yet another wedge between black and white people. Fast forward to 2008, America elects a black president. Unfortunately, this proves very unsettling to many people who have felt superior to black people when there's a black president and a black family in the White House. In 2015, Donald Trump began his campaign by calling Mexicans rapists. He called for a Muslim ban. When white supremacists marched in Charlottesville chanting, Jews will not replace us and blood and soil, which is straight from the Nazi playbook, Mr. Trump said there are good people on both sides. He recently called asylum seekers animals. Dylan Roof goes into a place of worship and murders black souls. Jews are slaughtered in Pittsburgh. Muslims are slaughtered in New Zealand. We need the Congress to stand up and act. 
Ranking Member, Member Collins, I was so delighted to hear your strong statement against white supremacy and that the Republicans took a lead in denouncing it. But we need you to do more. Out there where I live in California, we're not so sure where the Congress stands on white supremacy. So we're delighted that you're speaking up. I'd also like to address Chief Justice Roberts, who dismantled the Voting Rights Act in Shelby versus Holder. He said racism had been eradicated. That simply is not true. I hope he will talk to Justice Judge Bernice Donnell from the Sixth Circuit, who writes extensively on racism. We hope that a majority of you will want to give the country a signal that we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Potts. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Neil Potts, and I'm a director at Facebook with oversight over the development and implementation of Facebook's community standards, which are the rules for what types of content we allow on the platform. I'm a graduate of the United States Naval Academy and the University of Virginia School of Law, and prior to joining Facebook, I served as a ground intelligence officer in the United States Marine Corps and was deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. First, let me start by saying that all of us at Facebook stand with the victims, their families, and everyone affected by the horrific terrorist attack in New Zealand. I would also like to express my deepest condolences to the doctor for the unimaginable loss that he and his family have suffered. In the aftermath of such awful acts, it's more important than ever that we stand against hate and violence. I'm here to tell you today that at Facebook, we continue to make that a priority in everything we do. Facebook's mission is to give people the power to build community and to bring the world closer together. More than two billion people come to our platform every month to connect with family, to connect with friends, to find out what's going on in their world, to build their businesses, to volunteer, and to donate to organizations they care about, and also to help those in need. Our users share billions of pictures, stories, and videos about their lives and their beliefs every day. And that diversity of viewpoints, expression, and experience highlights much of what is best about Facebook. But as we give people voice, we want to make sure that they're not using that voice to hurt others. Facebook embraces the responsibility of making sure that our tools are used for good, and we take that responsibility seriously. I would like to be clear. There is no place for terrorism or hate on Facebook. We remove any content that incites violence, bullies, harasses, or threatens others. And that's why we've had long-standing policies against terrorism and hate, and why we've invested so heavily in safety and security in the past few years. That investment impacts both our human and technological capabilities. And Facebook now employs more than 30,000 people across the globe who are focused on safety and security. Those human reviewers and automated technologies work in concert to keep violent, hateful, and dangerous content from ever reaching our platform in the first instance, and to remove it quickly when it manages to get by our first line of defense. And we have the Pine protocols to place in place to pass on threats of imminent violence and imminent danger to law enforcement as soon as we become aware of them. Of course, hate can take many forms beyond overt terrorism, and none of it is permitted on our platform. Facebook rejects all hateful ideologies. Our rules have always been clear that white supremacists are not allowed on the platform under any circumstance. In fact, we've banned more than 200 white supremacist organizations under our dangerous organizations policy. And last month, we extended that policy to include a ban on all praise, support, and representation of white nationalism and white separatism. We see these ideologies as being inextricably linked to supremacy with intents of violence more generally. Our policies banning praise, support, and representation of white nationalism and white separatism are not intended to prevent those kinds of discussions about pride or having discussions about the country that we love, nor are they intended to stifle discussion about the harms that these groups cause. But to be clear, they are intended to stop hateful and dangerous content from being shared on our platform and part of our community. Additionally, we will be connecting people who search for terms associated with white supremacy, white nationalism, and white separatism to life after hate. 
That's an organization founded by former violent extremists that provide support and outreach. Now, determining what should and should not be removed from our site isn't always simple, given the amount of content that we have on our platform. We know we don't, and we won't always get it right. But we've improved significantly, and we continue to improve as we diligently ensure that our platform remains a safe, welcoming place for the global community. We want Facebook to be a place where individuals with diverse viewpoints can connect and exchange ideas, but they must feel safe to do that. Fostering the sense of safety is imperative, not just because of how it affects our community online, but because how it affects the world offline. There's a lot more to do, but we're proud of the significant progress we've made in the last few years. Still, we know, have, we know people have questions, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Ms. Weldon. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I appreciate your leadership on the important issues of hate speech and free expression online and welcome the opportunity to discuss Google's work in these areas. My name is Alexandria Walden and I serve as the Global Policy Lead for Human Rights and Free Expression for Google. In my work, I advise the company on how we can preserve our deep commitment to free expression and access to information in a complicated global environment. Broadly, the internet has been a force for creativity, learning, and access to information. At Google, supporting this free flow of ideas is core to our mission to organize and make the world's information universally accessible and useful. This openness has democratized how stories and whose stories get told. It's created a space for communities to tell their own stories. And it's created a platform where anyone can be a creator and can succeed. Around 2 billion people come to YouTube every month, and we see over 500 hours of video uploaded every minute, making it one of the largest living collections of human culture ever assembled in one place. We know, however, that the very platforms that have enabled these, these societal benefits may also be abused, ranging from the annoying, like spam, to the criminal, like child pornography. This is why, in addition to being guided by local law, we have community guidelines that our users must follow. Before I begin on how we enforce our policies, I want to state clearly that every Google product that hosts user content prohibits incitement to violence and hate speech against individuals or groups based on specified attributes. We view both as grave social ills, so our policies go beyond what the U.S. requires. We are deeply troubled by the recent increase in hate and violence in the world, particularly by the acts of terrorism and violent extremism in New Zealand. We take these issues seriously and want to be part of the solution. We understand that tough policies must be, coupled, must be coupled with tough enforcement. Over the past two years, we've invested heavily in machines and people to quickly identify and remove content that violates our policies against incitement to violent and hate, and hate speech. I'd like to briefly outline how these processes work at YouTube. First, YouTube's enforcement system starts from the point at which a user uploads a video. If it's somewhat similar to videos that already violate our policies, it's sent to humans for review. If they determine that it violates our policies, they remove it and the system makes a digital fingerprint so that it, can be up, so that it cannot be uploaded again. In the fourth quarter of 2018, over 70% of the more than 8 million videos reviewed and removed were first flagged by a machine, the majority of which were removed before a single view was received. Second, we rely on experts to find videos the algorithm might be missing. Some of these experts sit at our in-house Intel desk, which proactively looks for new trends and content that may violate our policies. We also allow expert NGOs and governments to notify us of bad content in bulk through our Trusted Flagger program. We reserve the final decision on whether to remove a video that gets flagged by any of these entities, but we benefit immensely from their expertise. Finally, we go beyond enforcing our policies by creating programs to promote counter speech. Examples of this work include our Creators for Change program, which supports YouTube creators who are tackling issues like extremism and hate by building empathy and acting as positive role models. In addition, Google's Jigsaw Group has developed the redirect method, which uses targeted ads and YouTube videos to disrupt <laughs> online radicalization. It's important to note that hate speech removals can be particularly complex compared to other types of content. Hate speech, because it often relies on spoken, rather than visual cues, is sometimes harder to detect than some forms of branded terrorist propaganda. It's intensely context-specific, and it can be contentious as there is often disagreement on what could be considered political speech. 
On the opposite end, over-aggressive enforcement can also inadvertently silence voices that are using the platform to make, them hurt, make themselves heard on these important issues. Often in this space, we've found that content can sit in a gray area that comes right up against the line. It may be offensive, but it does not violate YouTube's policies against incitement to violence and hate speech. When this occurs, we've built a policy to drastically reduce the video's visibility by making it ineligible for ads, removing its comments, and excluding it from our recommendation system. In particular, we understand the issues around YouTube's recommendation system may be top of mind. This is why several months ago, we also updated our recommendation <coughs> systems to begin reducing recommendations of even more borderline content or content that can misinform users in harmful ways. In conclusion, I'd like to end where I began. Google builds its products for all users from all political stripes around the globe. The long-term success of our business is directly related to our ability to earn and maintain the trust of our users. <coughs> we have a natural and long-term incentive to make sure that our products work for users of all viewpoints. People will value these services only as long as they continue to trust them to work well and provide them with the most relevant and useful information. That's why hate speech and violent extremism have no place on YouTube. We believe we have developed a responsible approach to address the evolving and complex issues that manifest on our platform. Thank you for the opportunity to outline our efforts in this space, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, uh, members of the committee. Uh, first of all, I must say I have Tourette syndrome. Sometimes I uh, have tics and make sounds I can't control. So please forgive me. <laughs> For the past 25 years, I've served as president of the oldest prose organization, the Zionist Organization of America. Uh, we promote strong U.S. Israel relations and work to protect American Jews and others from anti Semitism and violence. As a child of Holocaust survivors, I personally felt the horrors of unbridled anti-Semitism. I was born in a DP camp in Germany, grew up without the loving presence of most of my grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, whom the Nazis murdered. <laughs> a front page article in the New York Times Friday headlines, bias is shared by extremes of the right, left, and Islam. We should keep that in mind. <laughs> the Tree of Life Synagogue murderer was a neo-Nazi who hated white President Trump for not being anti-Semitic, called Jews in the Trump administration a kike infestation. The New Zealand mosque murderer was a, actually a left-wing, self-described eco-fascist who also published a manifesto praising communist China as the, quote, nation with the closest political and social values to my own. <laughs> Most of us correctly treat neo-Nazis and white supremacists as horrifying. History reminds us that we cannot write neo-Nazism off as a marginal phenomenon. There's a plethora of sickening neo-Nazi white supremacist internet sites fomenting hatred and violence primarily against Jews and blacks, but also against LGBTQ, women, feminists, and Muslims. We need to determine who is funding and is behind this. <laughs> the FBI reports, reports that Jews are the victims of 60% of the religious motivated hate crimes in America. Jew hatred is the canary in the coal mine. It's unfortunately incumbent upon us to speak about the major issue threatening violence against Jews and all Americans, which is Muslim anti-Semitism, which is strengthened by significant institutional support and the support of imams and is becoming mainstream. Let's look at college campuses. During the decades that ZOA has been combating campus anti-Semitism, we've never received a single complaint about anti-Semitic discrimination, harassment, or intimidation perpetrated by neo-Nazis or white supremacists. By contrast, we receive hundreds of calls from students about anti-Semitic harassment, discrimination, and intimidation perpetrated by the left-wing, significantly Muslim hate group, Students for Justice in Palestine, SJP, and its allies. COA's letter to city... <laughs> COA's letter to city university, we have documented that at these SJP rallies, it is common for SJP demonstrators calling for Israel's elimination, screaming Jews out of their campuses, Jews are racist sons of bitches, forgive me. When we take control of this campus, we're going to kick you out and make sure you don't graduate. Get out of America, long live the Intifada. Last week at Columbia University, the anti-Semitic hate group SJP distributed a flyer for its apartheid week with a caricature of a Jew that looks like it came from the Nazis' propaganda tabloid, Der Sturmer. <laughs> the Amcha Initiative database of almost 2,600 incidents confirms SJP and its allies are the perpetrators in most incidents on U.S. campuses. 
Unfortunately, that abhorrent incidents perpetrated by Muslim and leftist campus groups are rarely satisfactorily resolved. Let's look at the statistics. ADL's worldwide survey of 100 countries found that 49% of Muslims harbor anti-Semitic attitudes. This is a chart of that. You see the non-Muslims, it's far less. This is a painful fact uh, that ADL uh, has studied. <laughs> it's more than double the anti-Semitism found among persons of other faiths. ADL data also shows the U in the U.S., 34% of Muslims, according to ADL, exhibit a high degree of anti-Semitism versus 14% of the general population. The 16 countries and the territories having the highest level of anti-Semitism were all in the Muslim Middle East. Levels of anti-Semitism there ranged from 74 to 93%. Uh, in a recent conference on anti-Semitism, a speaker said, 20 years ago, the major problem was anti-Semitism of the far right, but it flipped. Now it's the left and radical Muslims. <laughs> we're in danger of seeing it spread uh, to the Middle East and to Europe. <laughs> the danger and problem is there is institutional support for violence by leading imams. Al-Azhar University, which is the West Point of Islamic academia, trains imams who fan out all over the world. A highly influential treatise by the former Grand Mufti Tantawi said, quote, gentle persuasion can do no good with Jews, so use force with them. Treat them in the way you see as effective in ridding them of their evil. At Al-Azhar Friday sermons, they've uh, recited hadith saying, we have to commit genocide against the Jews in order to usher in the messianic day of judgment. During the past year and a half, <laughs> in Moss, in North Carolina, New Jersey, California, Texas, Pennsylvania, imams have made the same speeches about genocide against the Jews. Can you imagine if rabbis called to murder Christians or priests were called to murder Muslims? We've demanded they should be fired. They weren't. <laughs> Wayne Hurst Ali, a well-known Somali former Muslim, uh, said, I confess that if you're a Jewish, I want to apologize to you. Um, when my half-sister showed me holy Quranic verses to support her hatred of Jews, I feared arguing with Allah for Allah would burn me. I also hated Jews. I'm ashamed of my prejudice against you in the past. <laughs> As Egyptian President Sisi said in a speech at Al-Azhar University, we need a, 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 a religious revolution. You imams are responsible for Allah. The entire world is waiting. <laughs> Let's speak frankly. We want to stop hate and stop institutions from supporting condoning it. I don't know how much time I have. You're, you're, you're 48 seconds over. Well, but I was stopped. I, I was stopped. The outburst. You're, you're, the outburst. Go ahead. <laughs> Another 30 seconds. I have something uh, very, very important to say. <laughs> Especially as a child of Holocaust survivors. I was horrified to see Speaker Pelosi, leader Hoyer, defend Representative Omar after her vicious anti-Semitic remarks. And pre and presidential okay, the gentleman's time has expired, Ms. Owens. That was unfair. It was not unfair. You had plenty of extra time, Ms. No, Owens. No, it did not. Ms. Owens. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, ranking... <laughs> There we go. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, Mr. Collins, uh, thank you for having me here today. I received word on my way in that many of the journalists were confused as to why I was invited, and none of them knew uh, that I myself uh, was the victim of a hate crime when I was in high school. That's something that very few people know about me, uh, because the media and the journalists and the left are not interested in telling the truth about me, because I don't fit the stereotype of what they like to see in black people. I'm a Democrat, I support the President of the United States, and I advocate for things that are actually affecting the black community. I'm honored to be here today in front of you all because the person sitting behind me is my 75-year-old grandfather. I've always considered myself to be my grandfather's child, and I mean to say that my sense of humor, my passion, and my work ethic all comes from the man that is sitting behind me. My grandfather grew up on a sharecropping farm in the segregated South. He grew up in an America where words like racism and white nationalism held real meaning under the Democrat Party's Jim Crow laws. My grandfather's first job was given to him at the age of five years old, and his job was to lay tobacco out to dry in an attic in the South. My grandfather has picked cotton, and he has also had experiences with a Democrat terrorist organization of that time, the Ku Klux Klan. They would regularly visit his home, and they would shoot bullets into it. They had an issue with his father, my great-grandfather. During my formative years, I had the privilege of growing up in my grandfather's home. It's going to shock the committee, but not once, not in a single breath of a conversation, did my grandfather tell me that I could not do something because of my skin color. Not once did my grandfather hold a gripe against the white man. I was simply never taught to view myself as a victim because of my heritage. I, I learned about faith in God, family, and hard work. Those were the only lessons of my childhood. 
There isn't a single adult today that in good conscience would make the argument that America is a more racist or a more white nationalist society than it was when my grandfather was growing up. And yet we're hearing these terms sent around today because what they want to say is that brown people need to be scared, which seems to be the narrative that we hear every four years right ahead of a presidential election. Here are some things we never hear. 75% of the black boys in California don't meet state reading standards. In inner cities like Baltimore, within five high schools and one middle school, not a single student was found to be proficient in math or reading in 2016. The single, mother would, the single motherhood rate in the black community, which was at 23% in the 1960s when my grandfather was coming up, is at a staggering 74% today. I am guessing there will be no committee hearings about that. There are more black babies born, there are more black babies aborted than born alive in cities like New York, and you have Democrat Governor Andrew Cuomo lighting up buildings to celebrate late-term abortions. I could go on and on, but my point is that white nationalism, white nationalism did not do any of those things that I just brought up. Democrat policies did. Let me be clear. The hearing today is not about white nationalism or hate crimes. It's about fear-mongering, power, and control. It's a preview of a Democrat 2020 election strategy, same as the Democrat 2016 election strategy. They blame Facebook, they blame Google, they blame Twitter. Really, they blame the birth of social media, which has disrupted their monopoly on minds. They called this hearing because they believe that if it wasn't for social media, voices like mine would never exist, that my movement Blexit, which is inspiring black Americans to lead, to lead the Democrat Party, would have never come about. And they certainly believe that Donald Trump would not be in office today. Looking on the next thing to focus on, now that the Russian collusion hoax has fallen apart. What they won't tell you about this, the statistics and the rise of white nationalism is that they've simply changed the data set points by widening the definition of hate crimes and upping the number of reporting agencies that are able to report on them. What I mean to say is that they're manipulating statistics. The goal here is to scare blacks, Hispanics, gays, and Muslims into helping them, center, dissent, helping them censor dissenting opinions, ultimately into helping them regain control of our country's narrative, which they feel that they lost. They feel that President Donald Trump should not have beat Hillary. If they actually were concerned about white nationalism, they would be holding hearings on Antifa, a far-left, violent, white gang who determined one day in Philadelphia in August that I, a black woman, was not fit to sit in a restaurant. They chased me out. They yelled race traitor to a group of black and Hispanic police officers who formed a line to protect me from their ongoing assaults. They threw water at me. They threw eggs at me. And the leftist media remained silent on it. If they were serious about the rise of hate crimes, we may, they may perhaps be examining themselves and the hate that they have drummed up in this country. Bottom line is that white supremacy, racism, nation, white nationalism, words that once held real meaning have now become nothing more than election strategies. Every four years, the black community is offered handouts and fear. Handouts and fear. Reparations and white nationalism. This is the Democrat preview. Of course, society is not perfectible. We've heard testimony of that today. There are pockets of evil that exist, and those things are horrible, and they should be condemned. But I believe the legacy and the ancestry of black Americans is being insulted every single day. I will not pretend to be a victim in this country. I know that that makes many people on the left uncomfortable. I want to talk about real issues in black America. I want to talk about real issues in this country and real concerns. The biggest scandal, this is my last sentence, in American politics is that Democrats have been conning minorities into the belief that we are perpetual victims, all but ensuring our failure. Racial division and class warfare are central to the Democrat Party platform. They need blacks to hate whites, the rich to hate the poor, and soon enough it'll be the tall hating the short. The time of the witness has expired, Ms. Clark. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and members of the committee, my name is Kristen Clark. I'm President and Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Thank you for the opportunity to testify during this critical hearing, which is about real issues that are truly a life and death matter for far too many. The Lawyers Committee is a national civil rights and racial justice organization created at the request of President John F. Kennedy in 1963, and for over 55 years, we've stood on the front lines of the fight for justice. We lead one of the most robust anti-hate and anti-extremism projects in the nation. 
from connecting real survivors on our 844-9 No Hate Hotline to training law enforcement and prosecutors, pushing reform in the tech sector and using the courts to hold violent white supremacists accountable, we work to confront hate every day. We know that hate crimes are not new, and we carry out this work with sensitivity to our nation's dark and sordid history of racial violence. African Americans in particular have experienced generations of racial terror. Between 1882 and 1968, there were over 4,700 lynchings in the U.S., and the majority of the victims were black. And since the FBI began publishing data on hate crimes in 1995, African Americans remain the single group most frequently targeted for hate. How are we fighting back? We successfully disrupted online platforms that promote hate and racial violence, shutting down and obstructing some of the largest hate sites online. We advocated for Facebook to abandon its ill-conceived policy under which they banned white supremacist activity but permitted white nationalist and white separatist activity because we know these racist ideologies are indistinguishable and equally dangerous. We're working with and pushing the tech sector to reform their policies to ensure that they're not providing a breeding ground for violent white supremacists. And we've partnered with the International Association of Chiefs of Police to strengthen law enforcement's response to hate as well. And we're also holding white supremacists accountable through the courts. Last year, we filed suit on behalf of a young African-American woman elected to serve as student president on her campus at American University. Following her election, she was subject to racist trolling. She was doxxed with all of her personal information published online. Bananas and nooses were hung on campus, including messages describing her as a gorilla. We secured a strong settlement last December with one of the defendants. But we can't do this work alone. We need our government to do its part. But today's national climate only fuels the fire. From the use of a racist expletive to describe African and Caribbean nations and much more, this administration's policies and rhetoric promotes animus against black and brown communities. We also see an FBI diverting resources to investigate so-called black identity extremism, all at the expense of combating real hate. Thus, it's not surprising that we're seeing an increase in reported hate crimes today. Corrosive white supremacist movements are tearing away at the fabric of our nation. And without question, they are using online platforms to recruit new members, activate followers, target communities, organize rallies, stream their murders, and incite violence. Instead of hiding under hoods, they now organize behind computer screens. They've sought to rebrand themselves, employing new labels to try and become more palatable to broader audiences. But regardless of what you call them, the alt-right, neo-Nazis, the KKK, Proud Boys, all pose the same threat today. What must we do now? As we continue to use aggressive lawyering strategies to move towards a society that's true to its democratic ideals, we call on all communities to help tear down the structures that facilitate violent white supremacy in our country. The banks that facilitate commercial transactions, the tech companies that provide open platforms, the web hosts that prop up these sites are all part of an infrastructure that feeds hate that must be dismantled. Congress must study and consider new laws for con uh, combating this online threat, and the federal government must abandon policies that fuel hate. At the Lawyers Committee, we're inspired by the strength and courage of survivors, and will continue to fight for a world in which no one is enforced to endure such immeasurable pain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll begin the questioning by yielding myself uh, five minutes. Uh, Ms. Hershenoff, are we or anybody else manipulating statistics to increase the apparent prevalence of white nationalist hate crimes, as was stated by one of the witnesses? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the ADL is data-driven, 
And we have defined, and in the report <coughs> submitted to you, we go through the details of right-wing extremism. Right-wing extremism last year was responsible for all but one of the 50 domestic extremist murders. We have submitted details about that. So that is 98%, 78% are white supremacy. Uh, one of the witnesses talked about global, the global attitudes that we look at. That's nonviolent looking at attitudes, and the ADL does track that. We feel it is incumbent. Vulnerable, marginalized, marginalized uh, communities have bigotry within them. It is incumbent first for the members of those communities to call it out. There are members of the Jewish committee that are, that are bigoted, that, might be, that are Islamophobic, and my community needs to call that out, just as other communities need to. But we, again, are data-driven. If you look at the trends, we have the FBI with 17% increase in hate crimes overall. We have the third largest, the third highest year last year of Muslim, uh, anti-Muslim hate crimes. We have, as Ms. Patterson and others said, uh, a huge increase in the uh, in race crimes and incidents. So this is the data that is there. And the report that we released today shows that there was uh, an increase, a doubling, 100% doubling of anti-Semitic slurs and content on the channels that the murderer, Bowers, in Pittsburgh, and the murderer in New Zealand looked at and Gavin Achan, and a huge increase in racism since the 2016 election. I am not saying that anybody, one person, one elected official caused that, but there are corollaries there that we need to understand and we need to look at. We need to look at the data. Thank you. Ms. Clark, white supremacist violence is on the rise. A 2017 report by the Government Accountability Office found that violence from the far right has actually accounted for 73% of deadly attacks since 9-11. Last week, the FBI urged that white supremacy is a, quote, persistent and pervasive threat, unquote. Yet the administration's response has been to rescind grants and ask Congress to eliminate DOJ's Community Relations Service, dedicated toward hate crimes, and which is dedicated toward preventing hate crimes and combating racial tensions. And DOJ has prosecuted hate crimes at a 20% decrease, despite acknowledging the rise in such crimes. What, can your what is your organization doing to ensure that there is an appropriate enforcement of against these types of hate crimes? You know, I was a former federal prosecutor in the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division prosecuting hate crimes, and I know that this Justice Department has unique tools in its arsenal and the expertise to do more to combat hate crimes. They should be stepping in and providing support to local law enforcement around the country when these hate incidents happen. There are churches burning in Louisiana. We need the government to step up and do more. We also need the FBI to do a better job incentivizing local law enforcement agencies to turn over the data so we can capture the hot spots where hate crimes are happening um, around the country. And then finally, we need to see this Justice Department using its bully pulpit more often to condemn hate when it happens. Um, as a civil rights organization, we're deeply disturbed by the Justice Department and um, this Attorney General and prior AGs prior to him uh, we're disturbed by their deafening silence in the fake of hate uh, incidents that we've seen across the country. Um, we're going to continue to bring pressure to bear to ensure that they do more and encourage Congress to use its oversight authority here as well. The final thing that I'll note is that uh, we're deeply concerned about the FBI's black identity extremist designation. This is mere distraction from the very real threat of white supremacy that we face today. Why is that distraction? Why is that a, dis a distraction? Because it is not real. It is not a real threat. It harkens back to the dark days of our federal government um, abusing its power to go after civil rights activists uh, during the heyday of the civil rights movement. Um, there is no such thing as black identity extremism. Um, again, this is mere uh, distraction to take the public's attention and the government's resources away from white supremacy and white nationalism, which are the real threats that we're up against today. Thank you very much. My time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Collins. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, Ms. Potts, I have a question. Just curious, where were you at in Iraq? Uh, Ranking member, I was uh, with uh, General Mattis in invasion of Iraq, so up through Safwan, uh, Dal Nazaria, <laughs> up through Baghdad, we retrograded out and uh, pulled back to go to law school. <laughs> Good idea. I was in Balad, so I was just curious on what, if we travel some of the same sands. So. Right. But it, um, interesting, I want to go into this, and, and look, I think there's interesting points made by all. I think one of the biggest distractions that we get is going back to what I said originally. The, anybody who traffics in hate is, is bad and wrong and needs to be called out and needs to stop. I don't care what side you're on, left, right, or in the middle. This, this good. And get back to the issues that we're dealing with every day. And much of this has to do with the fact that there's a, a desire for publicity. There's the 15 minutes of fame uh, issue here of those who are evil enough to go and do this. And one of the things we just saw recently was the live stream of some of this is now as the technology has progressed. This is something I'm curious about here because in your testimony, your written testimony, you talked about um, you know, the viral videos and the ability to recognize and spli you know, splice or edited content and other things like that. Where are we heading to cut this off earlier with AI is important, but also there is a human element to this as well, which also leads into other issues, not in this hearing that I'm sure will come up at other hearings, but I just want to see more on that issue right now. Thank you, Ranking Member. Uh, that's a great question. Um, as we try to combat any type of hate, whether it's terrorism, uh, hate organizations, even hate speech uh, to some level, we really try to combat that through a three-pronged approach. Uh, we look at uh, those three prongs would be the product, our people, and then our partnerships. Um, so first on the product, that's the AI. We have made significant investments in artificial intelligence to try to detect this, be, detect this type of content before it is seen, before it is reported, so that we can act more swiftly to remove it. Uh, we have made some significant progress. There's still a lot of room to go, but the investment over the next few years uh, going forward, I think we can still see uh, great gains to be made. Uh, secondly is the, uh, the people, and at Facebook we have over 30,000 people now focused on safety and security. That's subject matter experts. We have former prosecutors, former law enforcement officers, former intelligence officers like myself, ground intelligence officer, uh, others that write the policies and then help with the process. We have content moderators that, that focus on this and build out those processes, and of course the engineers that write, uh, write the code for the AI. And then the third, the third prong, and a very important prong, is the work that we do with our partnerships. Uh, we work throughout industry, I work with our colleagues at Google, uh, Microsoft, elsewhere on things like the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism. Uh, when we are able to share, uh, Ms. Walden spoke of hash sharing and, and digital fingerprints. When we're able to share videos that are violating across the industry, we're able to act more quickly. Uh, we also work with uh, many of our external, uh, with civil society, NGOs, and academics to get ahead of trends. And of course, working with the government to learn as well. And I appreciate that. And I think one of the concerns that we come in, in, into, and especially when you get into, and you said hate speech, other things, is what is the definition of hate speech in the regards to, you know, the person of the actual human actually translate. You know, for some, that might be uh, someone who is pro-life, maybe hate speech to someone who's pro, and we got, there's issues there. But when we come to this nationalism, this is an issue that we are, I think, addressing. I do want to go back to Ms. Owens for a second. You made a statement at the very beginning on why you were here, and I think the victim of, uh, if you've heard your story and there's been, you've told that story, I mean, times, but if you would share how that's affected your view as you go forward and the issues that you're wanting to address today. Uh, certainly. So when I was speaking about different classifications of hate crimes, which actually has increased and obviously impacts statistics, um, my when I was in high school, um, I received a slew of messages um, from the Democrat governor of Connecticut's son, um, Mr. Daniel Malloy, um, and at the time he was the mayor of Stanford, and um, his son, along with three other boys, referred to me as the N-word, uh, threatened to tar and feather my family and put a bullet in the back of my head like, like they did to Martin Luther King. This is a story that's not often spoken about um, because the media has no interest in telling the truth about how it's formed my views towards conservatism. Um, the media turned it into a firestorm and it became a, a political tool for people to gain power. The NAACP uh, used me at that time, uh, it would just meet me outside of the school with cameras in tow uh, to speak out against the crimes. Of course, now I'm older and I realize that that's really just a fundraising mechanism and that a lot of these groups survive because they cannot have the problem fixed ever. The NAACP never wants racism to go away. Um, Bottom line, all I was looking for at that time was an apology. Uh, the youngest person in that car was 14 years old. Um, and I understand that human beings can make mistakes and do stupid things. Uh, but we're not in a society anymore where an apology is good enough and we're obsessed with labels. We're obsessed with labeling people as racist as they did to those young boys. And it simultaneous, simultaneously impacted me as a victim. It's not fun to be a victim. 
And um, I, I'm, I'm adamantly against victimhood, and I speak out to the black community about how it ultimately harms us. Uh, and, and I appreciate Anthony for sharing that. And I think as we go forward, as I started my testimony with, is all of us here need to be heard. This is exactly what we're advocating. The more we hear, the more we can then at least relate to those who we may disagree with or agree with. And I thank you for, for being a part of the rest. With that, I yield back. Um, the uh, gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. Chairman and ranking member, let me thank you so very much for this hearing. And let me acknowledge each and every one of the witnesses. Your viewpoints are crucial to us. We are fact finders with our own personal emotions, uh, but we are grateful for your testimony. I want to, um, my time is short, so forgive me if I pointedly ask for abbreviated uh, answers. Let me say that um, coming from Texas, uh, I must uh, take note of James Baird, which as a member of the United States Congress and this committee uh, provoked and generated uh, the original hate crimes that was passed in the 1990s or early 2000s. James Baird was dragged through the streets of Jasper, Texas, decapitated, African-American male, uh, minding his own business in the late evening, I think he was found by either two or three white males. And that was almost 20 years ago. I give to his family my deepest sympathy, <coughs> as well as I give to our courageous witness who has come uh, to speak of his children in, in a horror uh, and horrific crime. And so today I want to say that I abhor racism and the stereotypes of African Americans, abhor anti-Semitism, um, I abhor Muslim, anti-Muslim views, anti-immigrant views, anti-LGBTQ views, anti-Asian and Latino, and any other hatred, religion or otherwise, that plagues this nation. Let me ask the representative from uh, the um, ADL, first of all, is hatred or is racism a reality? Absolutely, Congresswoman. And is a major target of white nationalists, African Americans? Yes, the core ideology of white nationalists, which is a euphemism for white supremacists, there are different types, but the core ideology is the belief in the imminent extinction of the white race because of a flood of non-white people and other people that they feel are degenerate, all orchestrated, puppeteered by Jews. You see may that I, in May powers. I continue with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Abdul Salha, and again, let me prayerfully offer uh, sympathy for that unspeakable tragedy. But my, my brief question to you, sympathy to your family, is did you teach your children, your daughters, hatred? Absolutely not, uh, Congresswoman. Um, I actually taught my children our faith on every Sunday afternoon for three years and a half. And that is why they were all loving and caring, and they were uh, cooking and distributing food downtown to non-Muslim people. Uh, I also sit on the board of my mosque, and we uh, definitely make sure that anybody so by who's, the, who's racist or hateful is out. By the very fact of being Muslim, you are not anti, you are not filling children or those in the mosque with hate, hatefulness. Absolutely. Ms. We, we fight this, actually. Ms. Patterson, let me just briefly thank you, sir, and forgive me for my time. Let me just thank you. You had a, a very provocative opening. Um, there was some reference to uh, reparations. I have introduced H.R. 40, which I take very seriously, uh, a commission to study the heinousness of slavery. But you mentioned, if you would just very quickly just say it again, uh, Mr. Thomas Jefferson's assessment of slaves. Could you just, just say that again for the record? Intellectually inferior. We um, are unattractive physically. And let me find the last horrible thing he said. There's no tenderness in our love. And we know what Thomas Jefferson was doing on the side, so these statements are Do a little Do you think strange. those themes have carried forward into the centuries? Oh, absolutely. Um, there are many people who really hate us. We, my organization has a weekly newsletter called This Week in White Supremacy, and every week we have 40 different items of people saying hateful things, saying we're monkeys. It's, it's pretty bad. Not everybody, and that, I think racism's going down, thank you. but it's still there. Thank you. I want Mr. Potts and Ms. Walden to answer this question very quickly, and then Ms. Clark. Um, Ms. Clark, 
if you just may, I may have a five seconds for you, but what the DOJ must do and what we must do. But to both Mr. Potts and, and Ms. Clark, uh, Ms. Walden, I'm sorry, uh, questions about um, generally how social media companies like Facebook can take down hate speech and likewise Google just precisely so I can give her at least two seconds. Thank you, Congresswoman. Again, uh, there's no place for hate or violence on Facebook. Uh, we act swiftly through our, both our AI and our human reviewers to remove that content when it violates our standards. Anything that's tied to violence, we are going to remove that uh, swiftly. Thank you. We also use a combination of AI and humans to review content and remove it. And in addition to removal, we promote counter speech across the platform. Ms. Clark, DOJ. The Justice Department must come to the aid of local law enforcement contending with hate crimes. They themselves should be bringing more cases and holding the perpetrators of these crimes accountable. The FBI should abandon its black identity extremist designation. And most importantly, they should use their bully pulpit to speak out against the awful hate happening across the country and incentivize better data collection from local law enforcement as well. The Thank you. The time of the gentlelady Thank Thank has expired. Uh, Burning churches. Thank you. Time of the gentlelady has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Chabot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start by stating uh, clearly and unequivocally that uh, I reject white supremacy and all forms of hate. I'm quite sure that my colleagues on this side of the dais uh, share that point of view. In fact, I'm quite confident that my colleagues on the other side of the <coughs> dais uh, do as well. Um, Ms. Owens, let me begin with you if I can. Um, I think it's fair to say that you didn't start off on the conservative side of the ledger. Is that correct? That's correct. I was a liberal. Okay. And uh, so just on a couple of issues, and you mentioned them in, in your statement, but just to go back to them, if you could uh, tell us again kind of what they are and, and what, um, what hatred that you've experienced as a result of having this point of view. Um, you mentioned the term uh, Blexit. Would you describe what that is and what hate that you've experienced as a result of your position on that? Um, I launched a movement called Blexit, which is the black exit from the Democrat Party. Um, when I became educated about the issues and stopped reacting emotionally, which is what the left wants us to do, presumably, when they hold up pictures of burning churches, I began to examine the facts and, and look at some of the narratives they were spinning. For example, in 2016, it was police brutality, and I realized that they are dissuading us against um, our own best interests. And I wanted to have a more productive dialogue with the black community about the issues that are actually affecting us and impacting us. When I announced that I was a conservative, I've never seen anything more racist, more disgusting, more vitriolic, and more hate that's come my way in my entire life than the things that Democrats um, and the media say about me today. I've been referred to as an Uncle Tom, a bed wench. For those of you that don't know, that means a slave that sleeps with the master, a house nig nigger. Um, and these are all words that have been said over and over again about black conservatives when they have the audacity to think for themselves and become educated about our history and the myth of things um, like the Southern switch and the Southern strategy, which never happened. You mentioned, I think, on, uh, well, let me ask you this. I think you did on the, on the life issue. Uh, you're you're pro-life. Is that, is that accurate? And That's correct. And I started off pro-choice. And what, what sort of uh, hatred, if any, have you experienced or do you get... Well, that, that hate tends to come a uh, majority from uh, Caucasian Democrats. Um, when I start telling the truth about the fact that the community that is the most impacted by abortion is the black community, uh, 800 to 900 black babies are aborted every single day. Uh, that amounts to about 18 million black babies aborted since 1973. And the black population has stagnated. Uh, we are not, our population growth has stagnated completely. These are the kinds of logical discussions that I've had that have earned me all the titles that we discussed before. I've got a whole bunch more questions, but uh, thank you for your time. I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. Klein, if I could, uh, for a couple of minutes. Uh, Mr. Klein, um, when you were giving your opening statement, uh, uh, you got interrupted. I'd like to, what were you going to say? And I'm not blaming the chair because it was over time. There were several witnesses that did that, and I, I get it. It's tough being chair sometimes. But what, what were you going to say? What was your point? I was going to make two, two. If you could turn the mic on there. Oh, I'm sorry. That's thank right. you. I was going to make two important points that it was very painful to me that in light of the vicious anti-Semitic remarks made by Representative Omar and others, that no one in that party, many in that party defended her, saying she's not an anti-Semite uh, and there was no consequences. She was not thrown off of any committee as Stephen King was for his uh, outrageous remarks. Uh, and I was going to simply end by saying, we need to investigate the students for Justin Palestine and BDS terror connections. 
We need to demand university leaders, very important, condemn SJP hate groups by name. They won't condemn them by name. They just say we're against anti-Semitism. Uh, we must demand colleges must suspend and expel students who would commit these terrible uh, uh, actions against uh, Jewish people, uh, and that Title VI should be invoked, and they should lose federal funding if they don't do the right thing when it comes to anti-Semitic bigotry. And finally, uh, we should be having consequences for members of Congress who make hateful and outrageous comments against blacks, Muslims, or Jews. And uh, when it comes to Jews, we have not seen that. Were, so, are there any, um, <laughs> you mentioned members of Congress. Um, there's a former member of Congress, I understand, that made a comment about uh, <laughs> Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, <laughs> recently. Um, are, are you familiar with that? And what, what is your understanding and what's your concern about that comment? <laughs> Well, that was Beto uh, O'Rourke, who uh, I believe you're referring to, who, who called Benjamin Netanyahu a racist. Uh, nothing could, could be more absurd than that. He was involved in helping uh, Ethiopian Jews, black Jews, come to, uh, uh, to Israel. Uh, he's actually had the, uh, the most uh, positive uh, policies toward the uh, Israeli Arabs of any prime minister we've ever had. <laughs> uh, so this is a ridiculous statement. Also, I might add, Benjamin Netanyahu has not built a single new community in Judea and Samaria since he's been prime minister. None. So it's not like he's even building all over the place, which is attributed to him uh, regularly. So this comment was uh, just really uh, outrageous and despicable. And I think it should uh, almost disqualify him for a higher office. And by him, you're referring to who? Beta O'Rourke. Okay. Thank you very much. I, uh, <laughs> my time's expired. The, uh, uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Firstly, I would like to uh, mention that the, uh, there was a fire just outside of Knoxville about a week ago, 10 days ago, where um, Highlander Education Research Center was burnt, burnt to the ground. Highlander is a famous think tank for activists, for People Against Nonviolence, where Dr. King went to be trained, where Rosa Parks went to be trained, where many people involved in the union movement have been trained. And when they went and looked at the damages, they found a uh, symbol of white nationalism on the grounds, painted on there, similar to what was in New Zealand, similar to what has been seen in Charlottesville. And I have written a letter to Attorney General Barr asking him to look at the possible uh, hate crimes or white nationalism that was exhibited there, and I would like to have that letter and the pertinent uh, attached stories about Highlander and a swastika painted on the rocks at the University of Tennessee publicly uh, entered into the record without objection. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Uh, first, I, I'd like to ask, uh, Ms. is it Hersenoff? Uh, Ms. Jackson Lee asked you about uh, uh, white nationalism and the main <coughs> folks they're against are African Americans or blacks. And I'm not competing in any way whatsoever, but isn't it a pretty close race between African Americans and Jews for the hatred of white nationalists? You know, I, I agree with you, Mr. Cohen, that we shouldn't compete. These things are absolutely linked. You might start with some <coughs> white supremacists on anti-Semitism and you will get to anti-immigrants, refugees, Muslims, African Americans, and vice versa. And I think, again, that if you look at these ideologies, and our researchers spend time, we look through tens, and in some cases, hundreds of millions of comments, images, and videos online. Um, what you see on, on this is that there is a, a, a you know, white supremacists used to want to keep dominance. After the civil rights era, they became more and more scared of the extinction of the white race by if they will call people who are LGBTQ degenerate or sodomites. Excuse me, I'm just going to use the words that we see over and over. They will call, they will look at the genetic inferiority of people that are not white. They will demonize refugees and immigrants. They yeah. will look at Muslims. And they say again and again, who are the ones that orchestrate this? They are the Jews. That is what Bowers, the Pittsburgh shooter, came in. He said, I don't want these hordes of immigrants and refugees. It's the Jews that are doing it. All Jews must die, he let shouted. Me, let me ask you about the, the, the Jews. Uh, I think it was Mr. Klein said something about Islam and how many some imams calling for certain actions, et cetera. Of all the crimes that you've looked into and studied, 
Have there been any where Muslim terrorists have killed Jews? In the, in the last 10 years, about 23% of the extremist murders domestically have been perpetrated by people who adhere to radical interpretations, radical and violent interpretations of Islam. However, the reason I understand we are having this particular uh, panel, this, partic this particular hearing, is that what we're seeing in the last three years in particular is a resurgence where most of the crimes are from right-wing extremists. That's I true, but let me ask my question. My time is limited. Have, do you have any record of, of, of people of the Muslim faith going and doing terrorist acts, killing Jews? Yes, and some years before. That when? is not. When? I believe that there was a, a, a group a few years ago, a, a gentleman a few years ago, who went and killed people who were not Jewish, but he thought were Jewish in a house. Was that in Kansas City? Ago. The Missouri um, deal? That was the JCC. Uh, the, I'm not, no, that was in a house. The recent JCC ones were actually a very troubled Jewish uh, Israeli bomb threats. Let me say this. There, there are not many cases. You can't remember when it was or where it was. There, there not are many not many cases. There are not many cases in the U.S. recently, but there right. are That's many, enough. many, That's many enough. Cases. We're running out of time. If President Trump would have come out after Charlottesville and said, condemn neo-Nazism and Klansmen, do you think that would have helped in the atmosphere of being of white people standing up and saying white nationalism is being something bad. Absolutely. The bully platform has to be used to tamp this down and to call out where we are seeing extremism. I, my time's limited, and when you say the bully platform, you're not referring to Trump. You're talking like Teddy Roosevelt, the bully platform. I understand that. <laughs> the gentleman, Mr. Potts, let me ask you a question. Uh, Twitter has an a, a opportunity for a person to report a tweet if they think it's abusive or harmful or hateful, et cetera. Does Facebook have that ability, and do they make it easy for people to do? The gentleman's time has expired, but the witness may answer the question. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, we do have the same, we, we have a similar ability. It is fairly easy to do to report those, and we also use our tools to surface those proactively uh, when we can. Thank you, and I yield back the remainder of my time. The remainder of the time. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomer. Thank you. And do appreciate all the witnesses being here. And uh, I do think we all agree. I'm not sure all agree that all agree, but I think we all agree. No one should have to suffer like any of you have, your children, uh, family members. Nobody should. It is outrageous. Um, and in this effort of trying to... Um, bring people together, uh, go back to the words of Abraham Lincoln, at least it's attributed, if you look for the bad in people expecting to find it, you most assuredly will. It's also true you look for the good in people, you're going to normally find something. Uh, I want to ask Mr. Klein, what are your thoughts about President Trump's remarks regarding uh -huh. the Charlottesville demonstration? where he's quoted as saying, you also had some very fine people on both sides. Well, I'm glad you asked that because the media has really completely distorted uh, the truth of that episode. Uh, what he meant, and he said so when he said it, is that they're fine people who want to get rid of Robert E. Lee's statue, and they're fine people who are not haters, who believe for historical reasons they want to keep that statue. And he made that clear. And then in the same breath, Mr. Gomer, in the same breath, President Trump said, quote, I'm not talking about the neo-Nazis and the white nationalists when I say fine people because they should be condemned totally. And yet the media has never made that clear that he, in that, in that statement, he condemned neo-Nazis and white nationalists. He did not mean that they were fine people. Quite the contrary. He's disgusted by those people. Thank you. And, you know, I look forward to the day when Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream is a reality where we judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. But I'm amazed how many times when there's an objection to something someone says that uh, if the person making the objectionable comment happens to be black or Jewish, then you're a racist or you're anti-Semite. And I've been 
uh, amazed, Mr. Klein, the Anti-Defamation League has called you, as I understand, a Jewish person to be anti-Jewish. Um, it's just interesting. Um, and let me I'll tell you what, Mr. Potts, uh, and I certainly appreciate your noble service to our country, uh, Facebook owns Instagram, correct? Thank you, uh, Congressman. Yes, Facebook does own Instagram. Yeah, and do they have the same, does Instagram have the same standards as Facebook? For the most part, we apply our community standards across Instagram, too. There are certain things where there are differences, but uh, for the most part, the community standards apply as well. Well, I'm told that I can have this screenshot at the back. Um, report as violence or threat of violence, and it talks about photos, or videos, extreme graphic nature. And there's a second screenshot, if I could see that. Um, here you have someone that's calling, we crushed the United States under our feet, et cetera. That was reported, and within a minute, uh, the report came back from Instagram uh, that there's no problem here, basically. These aren't the drones you're looking for, just move on. Uh, so I'm really curious, if you're gonna enforce these standards, why are they so quickly enforced uh, and erroneously enforced against people like my friends Diamond and Silk? Uh, that I asked them uh, recently when I saw them, uh, are you still having trouble with Facebook? And they said, now, anytime we say something nice about Donald Trump, we spend forever just trying to prove that we're not a Russian robot and uh, that they send us through all kinds of things just to keep using the service. And here you have people that, uh, as a result of their misunderstanding of their own religion, they wanna crush the United States. They think of us as the big Satan, Israel as the little Satan. Uh, and I would just encourage you to take a look at that and, and why someone who wants to destroy the United States and kill everyone in this room uh, gets a pass when uh, others don't. So I would welcome any explanation you can find for that. Thank you, Congressman. I'm, I'm not familiar with that exact example. I'm well, happy, I know it just happened. Uh, happy and happy to get that back to my team to make sure that we look and review that. Thank you. Any calls of violence that target people based off of their nationality, their ethnicity. Well, I know what religion, it's, we, it's we supposed would, to be. We would, we would remove it. I just unfortunately am not familiar uh, with, with that case, but that does go against our principles. I understand. My time's expired. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Walden, uh, many white nationalists have used misinformation propaganda to radicalize social media users. How is YouTube working to stop the spread of far-right conspiracies intent on skewing users' perceptions of fact and fiction? Congressman, thank you for the question. Um, most recently, we have made uh, updates to our recommendation algorithm so that content that's on the borderline is not pushed out through our recommendation system. So content that violates our guidelines, our hate speech guidelines, which prohibit anything that promotes and incites violence against uh, individuals or groups, uh, or promotes hatred against individuals or groups based on their characteristics, including race, gender, ethnicity, uh, religion. All of that content is a violative of our community guidelines. But content that's on the border is content that we no longer include in our recommendation algorithm, and it can also be demonetized and uh, comments are disabled, et cetera. So we do our best to ensure that content that is on the border isn't uh, isn't fully distributed across the platform. All right, thank you. And uh, Mr. Potts, uh, while Facebook has worked to stop the spread of the New Zealand video on its platform, three days later, the video was still spreading freely on WhatsApp, Facebook's encrypted messaging service. By design, WhatsApp does not have a way of tracking or preventing the spread of videos like the New Zealand video. What's Facebook doing to fix this issue and prevent WhatsApp from being used to spread hate speech? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, as you mentioned, on Facebook and on Instagram, we took immediate action uh, towards that video. Uh, once we were made aware, we were able to remove the video within uh, 10 minutes, and we were able to leverage our 
artificial intelligence by uploading the video, producing the digital fingerprint, as Ms. Walden explained earlier, uh, to prevent an additional 1.5 uh, million uploads. We actually prevented 1.2 million and were able to find 300,000 additional uploads of that video within the first 24 hours and had a very forceful and swift response. Uh, one of the issues in this case was that there were many variants of that video, but we continue to uh, improve the database, improve our artificial <laughs> intelligence uh, to surface those and have them removed, in many cases blocked. Uh, for, to your question about WhatsApp, they, WhatsApp has its own policies that uh, go towards content. Uh, they are committed to working with law enforcement, and they do, they do often. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Potts. Also, bots are used to manipulate and amplify speech on social media platforms, including conspiracy theories and hate-based information. Uh, how is Facebook working to mitigate the power of the bots that amplify misinformation campaigns and promote them to trending on its platform? Thank you again, Congressman. Uh, at Facebook, when we talk about bots, we talk about inauthentic behavior. We've recently passed we call our coordinated and authentic behavior policy to get at the root of the cause, which are networks of fake accounts or networks of inauthentic people uh, working in concert to hide who they are, what they're doing, and what their intentions are. Uh, over the course of the last year, we've taken down multiple networks, uh, well into the double digits now, uh, ranging globally um, throughout the world, uh, some with fiscal motives, some with other motives, um, and we're continuing to, to invest in that work, and it will be a priority going forward. All right, thank you. Uh, Dr. Abu Salha, my deepest condolences to you on the loss of your three uh, children. Thank you, sir. Does Islam teach Muslims to hate Jewish people? Absolutely not, sir. The mainstream Islam, and I am uh, a practicing Muslim, prohibits hating anybody based on religion or ethnicity or faith uh, or nationality. Uh, actually, in the Quran, it says that Killing any human being is akin to killing humanity, and reviving a soul is akin to reviving humanity. Um, I have to tell you that in, in the Middle East, where I come from, Muslims, Christians, and Jews lived peacefully together for centuries and centuries, only interrupted by politics at times or invasions and division. What you hear on the media is sometimes radical Muslims, and we in America, in our mosques are growing and evolving to where we have a process of uh, choosing and, uh, and electing our board members in the mosques, and we have policy to keep radicalism outside of our mosque and our country too. Thank you. I'll note uh, the tender uh, way in which both Ms. Patterson and uh, Ms. Hershevov um, touched you as you um, were sharing your pain about the loss of your three children. And um, my heart goes out to our nation for the pain that it uh, has collectively due to just uh, rampant violence based on hate. Yes, and with sir, that, I yield back. Uh, may, may I add one, one line only, is that after the tragedy, the, the funeral was about 6,000 people of black, white, Jewish, uh, Christian, non-denominational, even the atheist community denounced the crime. So uh, it was a scene that, is, that was American, actually. Thank you. Before we go to the next witness, uh, next uh, uh, member, we have I want to announce we have received a number of statements that will be included in the hearing record. I will not be able to read all of the names of the organizations, because they're numerous, but they include the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights, the Sikh Coalition, the Simon Wiesenthal Center. I ask unanimous consent that all the statements we have received be included in the record without objection. I also ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the letter to the committee from the NAACP requesting that we conduct this hearing in the first place, again without objection. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Buck, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Owens, I'm going to direct these questions to you, if I may. Uh, I don't know that you've seen this, but it's a memorandum that the majority uh, Democrats prepare for uh, the committee members. And in this memorandum, they uh, go through the various witness names and organizations that they represent, uh, the Anti-Defamation League, Legal Justice Society, the uh, uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, and then we get to you. Oh my goodness. Candace Owens, Director of Communications at the Conservative 
Nobody else is described as progressive or liberal, but you are described as a conservative advocacy group, Turning Point USA, and a conservative commentator and political activist known for her criticism of Black Lives Matter and the Democrat Party. Um, I, I think you've caused my friends on the left to, to go to their safe spaces, and I'd love to ex uh, explore with you a little bit of the reason for that. Um, do you consider yourself a conservative? I am a conservative, yes. Okay. Are you pro-life? I am pro-life. Okay. Does that trigger people when you see them, that they know that you're pro-life? It makes them very upset, and okay. Democrats hate me. Uh, do you own a gun? Pardon? Do you own a gun? No, sir. When next time you come to Colorado, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take you shooting. Are, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. Uh, are you proud of your family? I'm very proud of my family. Okay. Um, let me ask you something. Do you hate Americans with black skin color? Uh, absolutely not. I actually love Americans with black skin color so much that I'm willing to fall on the sword a thousand times for them to wake up and realize that we are being lied to, abused, and used by the Democrat Party. How about Americans with white skin color? Do you hate them? I do not, and that's a problem for people on the left. Do you hate uh, Hispanics? I do not. Do you hate uh, uh, Asians? I do not. Um, do you hate lesbians or gays or anybody from the LGBTQ community? Nope, I've got all of that in my family. <laughs> I'm baffled because in the chairman's opening statement, he said that you openly associate with purveyors of hate. Yes, um, purveyors of hate by his definition is anybody that supports the president. I support the president because he's done a tremendous job in helping the black community, despite all of the rhetoric from the media and leftists, so, which do so, not want him to be successful. Tell me a little bit about how the president has helped the black community, if you would, please. Well, he's lowered the black unemployment rate. It's the lowest it's ever been in the history. Uh, he's getting us off of our feet. We see, uh, I believe the last number I checked was 3.5 million people are off of food stamps, something that the black caucus sat down and didn't applaud. Neither did any of the Democrats applaud uh, because they want a system where blacks are dependent on the government. Uh, they, they are the people that put in place the policies that broke down the black family. And the biggest problem that's facing our community is father absence. Um, in every room that I've been in with the president, he talks about real issues and he doesn't pander to us. He doesn't do Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's southern drawl accent and speaking to us like we're slaves. He asks us important questions and the most important question he could have asked was black America, what do you have to lose? Because we were already losing under Democrat leadership. Do you, do you believe that you openly associate with purveyors of hate? I absolutely do not. I have, I have no tolerance for hate whatsoever. Do you believe that college campuses should be open uh, discussions uh, or there should be open discussions on college campuses for various issues? I absolutely do. You know, I do a campus tour tonight. I'm flying up to University of Connecticut to continue that. And we are being met with uh, aggressive <coughs> leftist groups. Uh, three Antifa chapters have declared they're going to try to shut it down. And uh, we face this violence every day on the left and nobody ever wants to talk about it. And I, I guess what I was going to ask you, um, you, you went on to explain it before I got a chance to, but have you ever been disinvited from uh, uh, speech opportunities at college campuses because of your conservative views? All the time. Um, Is that a form of hatred, do you think? Of course it is, and we're not talking enough about political hatred in this country. We're not talking enough about conservative activists being attacked, like myself. Uh, we had a student whose dorm was set on fire uh, for being a member of the Turning Point chapter, and all we preach is for free markets and capitalism as, as a means to lift the most people out of poverty. That is my belief, and of course, my main thesis is that black people do not have to be Democrats, and we are not owned by the left, and I understand that that causes some people trouble. So. As a conservative, you've attended many conservative events and, and uh, visited with many conservatives. Um, and I, I am not denying for a moment that there are white supremacists and we should condemn white supremacists, that there are Nazis and we should condemn Nazis, uh, that there are hateful groups all across the political spectrum and we should condemn those. But in your uh, interactions with conservatives, have you seen hateful speech, uh, bigotry, racism among the conservatives that you've associated with? Um, I, I speak in front of conservatives probably three times a week. I jump on a stage and I say everything pro-black. Um, and they are so supportive and they applaud. All they want is for black Americans to realize that they are Americans first and foremost. Conservatives are patriots. The president is a patriot and I'm a patriot. And there is no skin color in patriotism. Thank God we have you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. The, is here? It's me. Gentle lady from uh, California, Ms. Bass. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, and I want to thank all the witnesses that are here today. Um, Dr. Abu Salka, if I pronounced your name correctly, I that. offer you my condolences along with everyone else and sadly know your pain. Thank you. 
Uh, I wanted to know if after the tragedy, if in your been outspoken, if you have received any threats or harassment experiences of people harassing you for speaking out as a Muslim. I personally did not. Um, I did read an email last night uh, that warned me of coming here and testify. Um, but after the tragedy, there was a tweet that said one, that said three down, 1.6 billion to go. There was another tweet that said Craig Hicks should be uh, given the, uh, the Medal of Honor and, uh, and released from custody. <laughs> Thank you, I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, Ms. Patterson, you mentioned um, that you had some specific recommendations for us in terms of regarding uh, white supremacy, and I wanted to know if you could give us a couple of examples of your recommendations. Moment. We would like a national commission to be formed to study all forms of white supremacy. Uh, we think there should be a joint law enforcement civilian task force to study white nationalism and to outline an organized counterinsurgency strategy. Um, we, like, we don't like the notion of the lone wolf narrative. We think there's an organized white nationalist group around the world that is being connected. We want to study the role, and I'm glad you all have brought Facebook and Google here, to study the role social media has played in enabling this threat. We need to develop a clearinghouse for data collection, reporting, and analysis on white nationalism. We need to fortify the 15th Amendment so that there's more voting on the part of a disenfranchised group. Thank you. We think there should be humane immigration policy. One thing I think we need to talk about is that right now there are Latino children in cages. We think this is a definite manifestation of white supremacy thank and you. white nationalism. Thank, th th thank you very much. I think one of the first steps in, in addressing white supremacy, though, is really acknowledging the seriousness and the fact that it uh, exists at all. Before our, uh, before our last election, we had four acts of domestic terrorism the week or two before, and uh, they were not called that. From the man who had the bombs that fortunately didn't go off, the uh, individual that was in search of African Americans to kill in Kentucky, he tried to enter a church and he couldn't, and so he killed two random black folks. Uh, the, the horrible massacre at the synagogue, and then the shooting several days later at a yoga studio where someone was looking for specifically women of color. Uh, but in that, we have the uh, FBI that is very concerned about black identity extremists. And I just wondered, uh, Ms. Clark, if you could tell me of um, examples, how many acts of domestic terrorism were carried out by uh, African Americans in the last few years? Well, it, it is our view that this black identity extremist designation is, is false. Um, this was something created by the FBI's domestic terrorism analysts, analyst units. Uh, to uh, essentially target black activists today who are focused on issues like promoting police accountability. Um, we um, don't see any evidence that black civil rights activists pose a threat to our democracy Do today. Do you know of, of anyone, I know that there was a case in Texas where there was a, a young man who was arrested and incarcerated for a while, supposedly for being a black identity extremist. Do you know of any other cases like that? I'm not, uh, not familiar uh, with other cases, but I will say that we have a pending Freedom of Information Act request that we sent to the FBI several months ago, and just a few days ago we received mere acknowledgement um, uh, of our request. We think it's time for us to shine a light on what's happening at the FBI. Uh, it's time for us to get more information about the scope of their activities, who they're investigating. But most importantly, it's important that uh, we find out why they're diverting resources away from the real threat that drives the purpose of this hearing today, white supremacy and white nationalism. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to uh, also acknowledge when there was a threat by the uh, threats that were made, um, President Trump was asked about whether he sees white nationalism as a rising threat around the world today. He responded that he does not, but that, quote, it's a small group of people that have very, very serious problems. And I believe um, the woman uh, from the um, Anti-Defamation League 
when you talked about the incidences of white supremacist terrorist acts in the United States, what was the percentage that has risen? Over the last 10 years, it was 54% over half. Last year, it was 78% of extremist murders were by white supremacists. It's unfortunate that the president considers that uh, insignificant. And it's also unfortunate that after all of these acts, whether they've taken place in the United States or around the world, that he cannot bring himself to have a full-throated denunciation of white supremacy. Thank you. Thank the gentlelady. Before we go to the next witness, I want to read two paragraphs from a Washington Post story that was just posted online. A congressional hearing to explore the spread of white nationalism on social media, quick, meaning this hearing, quickly served to illustrate the problem Silicon Valley faces after anonymous users on YouTube began posting vitriolic attacks that targeted others on the basis of race and religion. The hearing held by the House Judiciary Committee was streamed live on the video site owned by Google, which is testifying Tuesday. Alongside the stream, a live chat featured posts from users, some of whom published anti-Semitic screeds and argued that white nationalism is not a form of racism. These Jews want to destroy all white nations, wrote, I won't put in the name. Anti-hate is a code word for anti-white, wrote another, etc. So uh, this just illustrates part of the problem we're, we're dealing with. Could that be a hate hoax? What? Could that be another hate hoax? Just keep an open mind. All I know is what I just read. The gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Biggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a list of political violence perpetrated or promoted by leftist organizations. Without objection. Thank you. And uh, I also, you know, I'm, I'm riffing um, on something that, that Mr. Buck, gentleman from Colorado, was talking about. But in the listing of witnesses in the chairman's memo, it did something I've not seen in my brief time in Congress, or indeed in my many years of legislative service in my home state. That is an editorial comment about a witness. Some might even consider that this not so subtle editorializing is in of itself an indicia of animus. It's unfortunate, but it demonstrates how easy it is to let one's bias appear even in what is supposed to be an innocuous listing of witnesses Would for this hearing. the gentleman yield? Yes, I will yield, sir. I assume you're... Uh, uh, you're referring to uh, what is written about uh, Candace Owens, where it says she's a director of communications at the conservative advocacy group Turning Point USA and a conservative commentator and political activist known for her criticism of Black Lives Matters and, uh, at, and of the Democratic Party. I don't think she could quarrel with the accuracy of that. It's a simple statement of who she is. No. Reclaiming my time. What I will say about this is you never, ever see anybody characterized in any other list of witnesses. This is the first time I've ever seen that, other than the stating what they represent or the group that they are from. This is seemingly, seemingly anyway, going beyond the bounds of what is the norm. That is an indication to me of how easy it is to demonstrate animus. And, and the, so it means for a logical question of Ms. Owens, which she's already addressed to some respect is, as you talk, Ms. Owens, and you go to universities, like I'm going to UConn tonight, do you receive hate speech directed at you? All the time, and I really do feel that the media on the left has made it okay. And I do just want to add that my biography, which I submitted, uh, you reduced it to one sentence, uh, uh, calling me a, a, just a conservative activist, and it wasn't what I said or what I submitted um, to your office last night. And are the, and I, I just think that you opened with anti-black bias, and I see it coming from the chairman today. And Ms. Owens, these efforts to shut you down when you speak publicly on issues that you care about under the protection of the First Amendment, are they peaceful? No, they're, they're really scary. Uh, they threaten us online perpetually. I receive threatening letters to my home uh, when the media drums up narratives and pretends that I hate black people or that I hate gays or that I hate Muslims uh, with no evidence supporting any of those claims. What they're inviting is for people to think it's okay to be violent towards me when they see me. They want to make it an act of virtue for people to be violent towards black conservatives that are outspoken. And there are, on occasion, false accusations and staged hate crimes. Um, what impact do those have on actual real hate crimes? It makes it harder, I think, for people to come forward or for people to believe it. Um, I don't see enough condemning of what Jesse Smollett did. 
uh, what, to this nation in, in terms of tearing us apart and, and causing a debate. And obviously the left was quick to believe him and put him on a platform despite absolutely no evidence. Um, and it just makes it harder. Again, it just makes it harder for us to come together as a nation, which I think is what the president uh, is trying to do, bring everybody together. And Ms. Owens, are you familiar with the case of Isabella Chow, who is a uh, UC Berkeley senator who was harassed because of a position to, she took? I am not. Well, Ms. Chow took a position of basically abstaining from a vote due to religious concerns and was harassed out of her position. And she was uh, hate speech galore, all arising and, and going forward. So it, it isn't that, that there isn't hate speech. It's that th we need to condemn all hate speech. That's, that's correct. I, I definitely agree. We need to condemn all hate speech. There's only one type of hate speech like that, that they like to talk about and give a platform to. Um, it, there is a double standard in this country, and that double standard, I think, is being felt the most by black conservatives, uh, the Jewish community, and Christians. And so, Mr. Klein, thank you, Ms. Owens. Mr. Klein, you remember the chairman agreeing to give you an extra 30 seconds because of the interruption that you experienced during your opening statement. And then do you remember being gaveled down by the chairman once you began speaking of the anti-Semitic remarks by a member of Congress? <laughs> and we've just timed this. You, you only got 12 seconds. I have 30 seconds left. And so I'm going to give you those 30 seconds that uh, you were promised and were denied. Well, I am deeply pained that after a congresswoman from Minnesota called Israel evil, hypnotized the world, Israel's an apartheid state, uh, Jews used their money to uh, promote the, what they want out of Congress, that this woman was defended by leaders of her party, defended by at least three mem members of her party who were running for president uh, with no consequence. She should have been removed from all of her committees just the way Stephen King was for this uh, unbelievable outburst of hatred uh, toward, toward Jewish people. Uh, uh, in fact, there's actually a member of this very committee who publicly called uh, Jews termites of this committee, and th there was no consequence to that outrageous uh, statement. So uh, this is really frightening to me, especially as a child of Holocaust survivors. If you're not, if there's not consequence of this type of hate speech against Jews, you're only going to get more of it. We're only going to embolden people to continue this, and ultimately, hate speech turns into physical violence. That's been true throughout Jewish history, and that really frightens me. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch. on uh, because I didn't turn on, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Potts, thanks for your service to our country. Um, Dr. Abu Salah, thank you for being here today. Um, I, I, can, I cannot imagine the pain that you feel every day, uh, but your being here and, and speaking out is helpful for this committee as we, as we work to make sure that the government is doing everything that it can uh, to address hate crimes, to focus as we are this morning on the rise of white nationalism. Um, I wanted uh, Ms. Hershenov to ask just a couple of questions. There was an a episode of the New York Times podcast, The Daily, last year uh, about a Gainesville, Florida police officer who was shocked by the murder of Heather Heyer at the Unite the Right rally and was concerned because Richard Spencer was going to be coming to uh, the University of Florida and reviewed, he, he reviewed websites, videos online, tried to prevent violence in Gainesville and found a complete lack of intelligence reports on the alt-right from government sources. The state police and the FBI didn't have helpful information for him. Uh, then you look at this story, and he, that was focused on the Justice Department. Then you look at the story from just a week or so ago uh, about the Department of Homeland Security and the branch of analysis and, and the Office of Intelligence and Analysis that focused on the threat from homegrown violent extremists and domestic terrorists, share that information with state and local law enforcement. And that group was, uh, the, that branch of INA focused on domestic terrorism um, was eliminated and the analysts were reassigned and there were explanations given as to, as to why that was. But uh, the, the question that, that I think both of these get at is, um, since, you, since the ADL tracks and reports on extremism, uh, if you could tell us whether what you think 
the government, in particular the Justice Department, Department of Homeland Security, can be doing more of in order to track and, and respond to these kinds of threats, and whether the kinds of reporting like the one that the New York Times reported on last year or, uh, or this article um, just a, a week or so ago um, accurately reflect um, a, a sense that there is, there is not enough attention being paid. What more can the government should be, what, what more should they be doing? What should we be focused on? Thank you for that question, Mr. Congressman. I agree with what you imply, that there has not been enough attention. And again, that is what this hearing is about, not other forms of extremism, but one that has been under-resourced, under-discussed. Um, we at the ADL are very concerned about the disbanding of that DHS intelligence group. We think that the DHS needs to do much more to coordinate DHS, DOJ, FBI in tracking uh, uh, extremism and domestic extremism. To disband that in an uncoordinated way among other places is not the best thing to do. That being said, and we've supported uh, legislation that you, you have sponsored, sir, um, we are well aware that you have to be careful in tracking uh, and you can't uh, uh, go over the edge of what is constitutionally protected. And we've worked with you and we'll continue on that. But uh, this, dis this disbanding is absolutely the wrong direction. This is not paying attention to a rising threat. And this government can do more than one thing. You do not have to stop paying attention to other threats by putting the necessary resources into this one. Um, thanks. It, Mr. Potts and Ms. Walden have talked about the way that um, online platforms have responded to hate. I'd actually like to focus on a different direction and ask you, Ms. Hershenov, how white nationalist groups actually organize online, whether it's on existing platforms or on the dark web, and why is it that we seem to throw up our hands and say, mm, it's the dark web, we can do nothing about it. Why, why shouldn't that be a focus of our work to, to go at the, the root of this, which is these uh, horrific posts that so often lead to violence? So that is a terrific question. First of all, let's look at Pittsburgh and New Zealand. And let me just take a moment to clarify something that was inaccurately said about the New Zealand shooter being an, a lefty echo uh, terrorist, because that, uh, uh, the New Zealand shooter um, had ties to the alt-right and identitarianism. His manifesto raged against immigration and white genocide. He said, quote, we must crush immigration and deport those invaders already living on our soil. It's not a matter of our prosperity, but the survival of our people. And his weapons and gear were full with white supremacist uh, 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 images. So apologies for, for uh, saying that. In terms of what we can do, we see places, some of the smaller websites that radicalize. What these do, what, what so many of these white extremists are, are lone wolves. They're not part of like a hate group. They don't go out to their neighborhood like decades ago to find the local <coughs> Ku Klux Klan. They find communities, they find materials. That is their community, that is the group, that is who they signal to, they recruit, they radicalize, they reach them. So we, and then and if they're thrown off of bigger platforms, they go on to little, smaller ones. So what I would say on the social media is one, we do have to be careful about whether in taking stuff off of the web where we can find it, we push things underground where neither law enforcement nor civil society can prevent and de-radicalize. There is a balancing act there that we have to do with. Yeah. Um, to the, may I say two more things, Mr. Chairman? Quickly. Okay, to the tech companies, I would say that there is no definition of, of methodologies and measures and hate, the impact, what type, is it images, is it podcasts? Um, we don't have enough information, and they don't share the data in order to go against this radicalization and to, uh, and to counter it. We need better information and a more rigorous framework. The time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Clintock from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I've been listening to the testimony and, and the questions, it, it strikes me that perhaps both sides are losing a perspective of why we have a First Amendment uh, it's because the freedom to speak our minds is absolutely essential to a free society. Uh, Jefferson said, error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is free to combat it. Uh, speech can be ugly, disgusting, hateful, 
prejudiced, and alarming, but it can never be dangerous to a free society as long as men and women of good will have the freedom of speech to dispute it, challenge it, and reject it. A suppressing speech, even the most hate-filled speech, doesn't diminish its influence, it strengthens it. I think Churchill made this point very clearly when he said, it is the very conflict of spiritual and moral ideas which gives the free countries a great part of their strength. You see these dictators on their pedestals, surrounded by the bayonets of their soldiers and the truncheons of their police, yet in their hearts there is unspoken fear. They are afraid of words and thoughts. Words spoken abroad, thoughts stirring at home, all the more powerful because forbidden, terrify them. A little mouse of thought enters the room and even the mightiest potentates are thrown into panic. And then he goes on to say, a state of society where men may not speak their minds, where children denounce their parents to the police, where a businessman or small shopkeeper ruins his competitor by telling tales about his private opinions, such a state of society cannot long endure if brought into contact with the healthy outside world. Free societies don't punish words and thoughts, they punish deeds. And the reason for that is because words and thoughts can be countered by words and thoughts. That's why we have a First Amendment. And what we're seeing across the, the world today is that it is a very slippery slope between banning hate speech and banning speech we just hate. We've seen many examples even on our own country recently of legitimate speech being suppressed on college campuses, on social media platforms, uh, and even in public discourse. You know, if there's an ideology that we don't like, the weakest thing that we can do is try to forbid it or suppress it. The strongest thing we can do is to use our own freedom of speech to confront it and defeat it on its merits. If we allow our society to become one where men and women may not speak their minds, as Churchill said, we'll have lost the very quality that, he said, gives free countries a great part of their strength. As Churchill said, these ideologies cannot long endure if brought into contact with the healthy outside world, but that in turn requires unrestricted freedom of speech, precisely the freedom that's protected by our First Amendment. Now, we've made very limited exceptions when uh, speech becomes explicit incitement to do violence uh, or to falsely defame an individual's reputation, but even in the case of defamation, the truth is always an absolute defense. What we're hearing now is something fundamentally different. It's to set up government or corporate officials to decide what speech is acceptable and what is not. And that is a very dangerous power that can quickly be abused. Uh, today, a great deal of public discourse is conducted on social media, uh, major platforms like Google and Facebook uh, that are here today. Uh, we've granted them legal immunity from the content of their platforms under the assumption that they're merely providing a public square and that those who use it should be held accountable for their own statements. Uh, this is appropriate as long as these platforms are not practicing any form of censorship or favoritism uh, uh, other than, of course, uh, 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 censoring explicit incitement to violence. Uh, we're discovering, however, that they're indeed practicing censorship and political favoritism. Uh, this is their right as private corporations, but once they begin to practice censorship and political favoritism, they cease to be neutral platforms and instead become publishers who are responsible for their content and subject to action for incitement or defamation. So my question to the internet platforms represented here today is, I don't think you can be both. You can't be a neutral platform and at the same time exercising editorial control over content. So the uh, question very simply is, which are you? Are you a neutral forum, or are you a, um, an editorial publication responsible for your content? Mr. Potts, Ms. Walden, which is it? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, first and foremost, Facebook is a tech company. Uh, we are not a, a, a platform in that sense. We are not a content creator. We do not edit content, although we do moderate content under our community standards. Uh, after hearing your, your discussion, I think those are many of the, the issues that we wrestle with. To give people the ability to have a voice on a platform, but also to balance safety. We err on the side of allowing more speech. We want to give people the voice, but we do have to draw lines somewhere. And we feel that by drawing lines about, around things like calls to violence, even some things that are more uh, just egregious, child pornography, for example, by not having that on the platform, we'll give the platform to more people so they can share their voice. 
So it's a, it's a constant tension that we wrestle with. We wrestle with daily. My teams wrestle with it all the time. We try to strike that balance. It's a hard one. We know that there are many opinions. We want to be across all the spectrum of ideas to have, to have those ideas uh, fostered on the platform. Uh, but again, it is, it is a difficult discussion. The concern is some... The uh, gentleman has expired. Ms. Walden may answer the question, too. YouTube is a place where we want anyone to come and share their ideas, diverse opinions about their politics, um, things that are even controversial or offensive. Our community guidelines are, are politically neutral, um, and YouTube is a place where users are uploading content. So the community guidelines are in place to ensure that we are creating a free and open platform for users to upload their own content, um, but they're also in place to ensure that that's happening free from hate, from violence and harassment <coughs> on the platform. The time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me start by uh, asking unanimous consent to place into the record a letter that I wrote as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus June 17th of last year to uh, Attorney General Sessions and Acting Director McCabe uh, expressing our concern over the rising, uh, the alarming number of hate crimes, the rise in hate crime, and all of the other things, and asking uh, this Congress to hold a hearing. So I want to thank that you for doing that, and I'd like to insert that into the record because that was before Tree of Life. Without objection. That was before uh, Charlottesville. So I want to thank you for stepping up to the plate and having this hearing. Uh, let me just say, because we, we heard a, a pretty accurate uh, description of the First Amendment. And I will not impugn any intent to it, but I think that there was one glaring omission, which is you don't get to yell hate in a crowded theater. And just because you're upset with your station in life and sitting in your mama's basement in your boxers, you don't get to spew hate that you know uh, will incite violence uh, because you can hide behind uh, anonymity. Uh, it was said that we're fear-mongering, and the concern over white nationalism may be misplaced or even, uh, I think it was quoted as stupid. I will just tell you that the families of the Emanuel Nine, um, those were real funerals. Those are real kids without real parents. Those are real grandparents who were worshiping the Lord and invited the young man in and let him share with them their worship experience. And according to the perpetrator, he said they were so nice, they were so welcoming, I almost changed my mind. So I want us to put it back in perspective what we're talking about here. It's not just free speech. We are talking about inciting violence. We are talking about finding and influencing weak people to do dastardly deeds because the pain is very real. Uh, so, and now look, I'm equal opportunity and I'm very honest about how I feel. We know words have consequences. You can ask Congressman Steve Scalise. Words have consequences, and we owe the American people better rhetoric. But my fear is that we can't have 1600 Pennsylvania giving harbor and uh, empowering people to feel that way. So with that, since we have a White House that is actually probably giving safe harbor and uh, condoning it, let me ask the tech, tech companies, because you all did say that you will inform law enforcement when you find bad users. Do you talk to each other at all? So that all the plat so if you identify somebody, will you then alert Google and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everybody? Do you, do you all coordinate at all? Thank you, Congressman. I'll, I'll start, uh, Swalden. 
Uh, we do have a strong uh, industry partnerships. One is the uh, GIFCT, and that is the Global Internet Forum for Counterterrorism. So in a case like New Zealand, for instance, uh, when we became aware of that, uh, our first priority was to work with the New Zealand law enforcement, which we did. We sent uh, some of our trust and safety officials on the ground to be a resource uh, for law enforcement. But one of the next steps we took was to upload that, the images uh, within to our AI, designated as a terrorist attack, and then go work with companies like Microsoft, Twitter, Google, Snapchat, others, sharing that across the board so they could also be on the lookout and then uh, enact their systems to prevent it. I can just reiterate that the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism is, um, is a body that the four companies founded. And um, in the context of New Zealand, it is a way in which we used hashes to ensure that there was we were minimizing the distribution of that content in the context of New Zealand. Um, there have long been close partnerships between the companies on working on issues around hate and violent <coughs> extremism and terrorism. Um, and we find that that really enhances our ability to learn from one another in the ways that we're tackling these problems um, that are unique on our individual platforms. Well, thank you. And I would just encourage you all to figure it out because you don't want us to figure it out for you. So thank you. And with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. So the first time I ever spoke on the floor of, uh, of the U.S. House, it was to condemn white nationalism and white supremacy. I'm, I'm very proud of this. I'm also very proud of the fact that <clears throat> earlier this year, when a member of my own conference of my own party made inexcusable remarks, Republican leadership acted very quickly and disciplined him. In fact, that member sits on zero committees right now. It's a shame that the same can't be said for my colleagues across the aisle. They continue to stand by and accept anti-Semitic remarks from a member of their own party. They couldn't even unite around a simple resolution to condemn anti-Semitism without watering it down. Last year, 11 Jewish worshipers were killed and six others were wounded at the Tree of Life Synagogue, which is just outside my district in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The day after that cowardly act, I stood in solidarity with Americans of all religions, of all races, of all ethnicities, at a vigil to honor the victims of that crime. We have to come together as a nation to stand up against hatred and bigotry in all forms, and all forms includes anti-Semitism. So Mr. Klein, what do you think Congress can do to combat the rise of anti-Semitism? <laughs> well, one of the initial things I agree with you, Congressman, is uh, uh, there should be consequences to members of Congress who make repeated anti-Semitic remarks that are false, in addition to being uh, insensitive. Uh, when there's no consequences, it only emboldens others to continue that. Uh, and uh, uh, also when it comes to campuses where there's been c constant uh, verbal violence against Jews, there's been no consequences. The universities refuse to publicly name those people who have uh, uh, made the, uh, these awful rallies and statements, and they've never dismissed them uh, from school expel them, but by the way, when these types of episodes occur against blacks or gays or Muslims, they are expelled frequently. That's common, as they should be. I'm not opposed to that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and we should, understand, we should really study why is it that uh, one half of the world's Muslims have anti-Semitic views. This is a ADL's own survey. It's not my survey. Why are one third of American Muslims have anti-Semitic views? Is it a coincidence that two of the three freshmen who have made anti-Semitic remarks happen to be of that faith? We should have a study about that. And uh, 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 President Sisi, a Muslim leader of Egypt, has said that we need a religious revolution and imams must step up to the plate and start uh, 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 making it clear that Islam has got to stop interpreting uh, the, the Koran in the way it does, which promotes hatred to all, all sorts of people, especially Jews. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Klein. Uh, you were speaking briefly about college campuses. Uh, I speak a lot of college campuses, and uh, there's a lot of talk about boycott, divestment, and sanction, or the BDS movement. Um, in your opinion, is this fueling the anti-Semitism on college campuses, and if so, to what extent? Yes, BDS is an anti-Semitic movement to, whose goal, its leaders say openly, is to destroy Israel, to boycott, divest, and sanction uh, 
Uh, fortunately, uh, university presidents has not allowed anything to happen with that in, 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 specifically, but resolutions are passed regularly on this. Uh, there's rallies about this, really demonizing Jewish people and demonizing the Jewish state of Israel. We really need strong federal laws that uh, make it clear that American governmental uh, bodies will not do business with any organization or company that supports BDS. They can say whatever they want. It's not a freedom of speech issue. They can condemn Israel and Jews, but, but the U.S. government will not do business with them. That's really what, what has to happen because the, the ultimate goal of BDS is, is Israel's destruction. And these people, by the way, never condemn the Palestinian Authority, never condemn other outrageous uh, entities that promote hatred. The Palestinian Authority pays Arabs to murder Jews. They name school streets and sports teams after Jew killers. They incite hatred against Jews in their schools, in their media, in their sermons and speeches, and you never see these BDS people condemning this really vicious human rights abusing entity, making it clear this is all about Jews, it's all about anti-Semitism. Thank you um, for your uh, responses. I yield back the remainder of my time. Mm -hmm. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our witnesses for being here. There have been obviously a number of very high profile acts of violence in the United States by white supremacists, the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, the Mother Emanuel Church in Charleston, and the Sikh Temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin. And so I thank the chairman for, for uh, convening this hearing and regret that there are some on this panel who have tried to hijack this hearing and desecrate the lives lost to the hate crimes and violence of white supremacists by uh, attempting to use this as an opportunity to promote a political position or a political party. And I think that is despicable and deeply regrettable. During the last 10 years, 76% of individuals killed by right-wing extremists were killed by white supremacists, making, as you say in your report, uh, making white supremacy the most deadly type of extremist movement in the United States over the last 10 years. That is a fact, and we have to do something about it. And that's what this hearing is about. And so I want to begin with um, first the, the, the technology platforms, because I do think something that is different today is that the ability of white supremacists who are advocating violence and advocating and preaching hate have an ability to reach many more people because of the advent of technology. And so it seems to me, I, I would take it both you, Mr. Potts, and you, Ms. Hayden, agree that those, there's, a, there's a rise in white supremacy activity in the United States. I think that's pretty clear, correct? You, you don't dispute that. Can you answer? <laughs> you, 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 don't, you agree that white nationalism is enjoying a meaningful resurgence in the United States based on the reporting from ADL and law enforcement? Yes, I'm aware of all the okay. research. And there's no question that media companies <laughs> play a role, not intentionally perhaps, but play a role in facilitating the spread of uh, communications on behalf of white supremacists or on behalf of the white supremacy movement. That's something we're absolutely concerned about. That's okay. why we have policies Great. in place. And, and you both, both Facebook and Google, believe that you have a responsibility to um, curb or prevent or restrict as much as you can the spread of these kinds of attacks on your platforms. Correct? Yes, yes Congressman. So, um, let, let me ask specifically, um, you referenced, uh, Mr. Potts, the, the creation of the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. I think both Facebook and Google are part of that effort. And at Facebook, uh, you uh, hired uh, in 2016 a number of individuals to proactively uh, examine and remove things from Facebook that uh, were considered connected to terrorist groups. That is uh, that's correct, Congress. And that has been a reasonably successful effort so far, has it not? We've made significant investments and significant progress. Right? And will Facebook today commit to dedicating the same kind of full-time team to proactively removing white supremacist content and promoting counter speech as you did with terrorist propaganda? Uh, that's an easy commitment because we are doing it currently, Congressman. You, you have a global internet forum to, to combat white supremacy? Congressman, we treat uh, white supremacy and white uh, hate organizations under our terrorist standard. So, so let me ask you with, uh, about a, specific, a particular case. Um, Facebook announced on March 27th that it would ban white nationalist content from its platforms, acknowledging that white nationalism and separatism cannot be meaningfully separated from white supremacy and organized hate groups. 
A few days later, on March 30th, Facebook publicly said that the video from Faith Goldie, entitled Race Against Time, where she stated openly that people of color and Jews are replacing white populations and specifically urged viewers to help stop the white race from vanishing, uh, did not violate Facebook's policies. A week later, as of last Friday, the video remained on the platform and was only formally removed yesterday. So my question is, why was it not immediately removed? Facebook has said it will ban Faith Goldie and other accounts, including from the Aryan Strike Force. But what specific proactive steps is Facebook taking to identify other leaders like Faith Goldie and preemptively remove them from the platform? Thank you, Congressman. When we become aware of someone that espouses hate and violence, that has ties to these ideologies, we do review them and we will remove them if we can find those necessary links. I think that's the case with uh, Ms. Goldie. I believe she was removed from the platform. There will be no praise, support, or representation of her on our platform going forward, and I believe that is effective as of yesterday. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to just read um, and ask the witnesses to respond to a letter from Ben the Ark to the committee that reads in part, it is not only the Trump administration's rhetoric and refusal to unequivocally condemn white nationalism that is problematic, but his actual xenophobic policies have emboldened the most openly racist elements of our society and pose grave danger to immigrants and people of color. Violence does not just take the form of mass shootings and vigilante murders. It is also family separation and refugee bans. It's not just racist slurs about Mexicans and Muslims. It's the misuse of executive power and the declaration of a national emergency. Social movements on the extreme right are energized by such policies and such words. Some of them move to violence. Others mobilize to pull the country through policies and through politics ever more in the direction of bigotry, mistrust, and polarization. It feels like that's the elephant in the room that's been absent. The role of the bully pulpit of the President of the United States, and I'd ask at least, uh, uh, may I ask, I'd ask the first three witnesses. And I wanted to express to Dr. Abu Salha, thank you for being here, and we all express our deep condolences and your courage and strength to be here is a nice way to honor your three children. Thank you. I'm not sure. Dr. Henshaw from the ADL. Certainly. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I completely agree with you. There are two things that we need from our leaders. One, we need what they say. And when they dehumanize and demonize <laughs> refugees or, or Muslims or uh, anybody else from a marginalized community, that's a problem. And the other is policies, what they do. And when you have anti-Muslim bans and anti-immigration and refugee stuff, this gives embrace and emboldens white supremacists. I am not saying that they are white supremacists. I am saying that this is celebrated and emboldened. So you are absolutely right. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. Um, as I said earlier, I come here in peace and I don't, I think I only see two members of the GOP here. Is that correct? Right at this I'd moment? Make a statement, please. Pardon? Uh, no, 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 but th I, this is important. Um, I think the point you raised is very important. I was delighted to hear that the Congress has come out against white supremacy and white nationalism. But one thing that troubles me and friends of mine is that you don't seem to say anything when President Trump says these provocative things that we think embolden um, white supremacists and white nationalists. And I understand the political dynamics, but we would love to see Republicans stand up and say, Mr. Trump, what you're saying is not helpful. It harms people of color. It harms Muslims. And so I would just call upon you, not in an adversary way, but in a genuine way, if you find things that, he are, that he's saying are negative, that you Time would say the, something. Well, we we would like that as well. Vote him accurately, too. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Stubbe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would love to see my Democratic colleagues condemn anti-Semitism. I have a resolution that I have filed. Um, one of their own members of their own caucus have said very racist anti-Semitic remarks and have failed to directly address that. So to your point, I would love to see the other side of the aisle condemn one of their own for their own anti-Semitic remarks. I would like to take my time to yield to uh, Ms. Owens. If there's anything that's been said, I'm the last Republican here. So if there's anything that you would like to respond to, I'd like to give you uh, the balance of my time to do that. Uh, yes, I actually wanted to respond to Congressman Cicilline um, because he was making references to me 
and I, and I thought that was a bit cowardly. Um, he said uh, he was dishonest when he said that the president refused to condemn white nationalism. Mr. Potts just literally gave the exact quote, the president doing just that. Uh, he does not want to accept the reality that the president has under multiple occasions condemned white supremacy and white nationalism. And the best condemnation of that is in the president helping the black community every single day with his policies. He also brought up family separation. This seems to only be an issue um, uh, for illegals at the border and nobody ever wants to talk about black babies being separated from the womb of black mothers. So if he actually cared about that, he would be embracing me. And lastly, he brought up the rhetoric of the president um, as in the same breath that he referred to me as the despicable. I'm tired of hearing the left refer to people as despicable, as deplorable. We are Americans and we are patriots. And even if we disagree with you, name calling should not be something that is done, especially in, in, in these chambers. Thank you, Mrs. Owens. Uh, Mr. Klein, is there anything that you would like to respond to that's been said? I will give you the remainder of my time. <laughs> I, I'm really confused when uh, the, the good doctor says that Islam does not uh, teach hatred of Jews. There's no problems with that issue. <laughs> when, in fact, there's a dozen or more imams in, in states around the country who have publicly made sermons calling uh, to murder Jews. This is a hadith that's, that's related to the Koran, that's considered very holy. The leaders uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the Muslim world from Al-Azhar University have made vile statements against Jewish people. <laughs> and uh, uh, we really need to have Muslims step up and do what, what the President Sisi says. And there has to be a, a, a reformation and a rethinking of, of, uh, of the, the, the aspects of the Koran that promote hatred against Jews. Uh, that's why you have constant uh, murder of Jews in Israel, uh, despite the fact that Israel has offered a state to the uh, Palestinian Authority four times in the last 20 years. <laughs> so this is, uh, to me, uh, one of the most serious issues as to why are, are half the world's Muslims anti-Semitic? Why are 75 to 95 percent of the Muslims in the Middle East anti-Semitic? Why are one-third of Muslims in America anti-Semitic, which, which is two to five times the rate of anti-Semitism of any other group? This has to be explored. But people are afraid to because then they're called an Islamophobe. And this has nothing to do with Islamophobia. This has to be, do with the truth, with data that ADL themselves has, has, has uh, put forth, surveys have put forth. Pew has also put forth similar data. Why is this an issue? We have to talk about uh, this Muslim anti-Semitism uh, because uh, uh, this is endangering Jews really uh, in America and throughout the world. God forbid this will be tra translated into physical violence even greater than we're seeing today. Thank you, Mr. Klein. I will... Uh Take the balance of my time to the gentleman from Texas. I thank my friend Ed. Um, it is interesting that mm -hmm. the first person and possibly the only American ever ordered killed by a U.S. president with a drone strike was Anwar al uh, The only reason he was a U.S. citizen is his parents came over on a visa and he was born and they took him back to Yemen, taught him to hate America. Uh, but he was working with the Bush administration and the Obama administration, and apparently, uh, as an imam, he was encouraging terrorism that they didn't realize at the time, but apparently that justified killing an American citizen without a trial just through the drone strike. And I really appreciate the atmosphere here. and. Ms. Patterson, you sound like somebody I would love to be listening to every day, all day. And I would just encourage you, you know, in, in the name of eliminating hate, it, it helps if you don't misquote or mischaracterize statements of the president. He never said uh, asylum seekers are animals. He was talking about MS-13. And if you see the pictures of what they have done, I don't condone calling humans animals but I've sent people to prison, I've even sentenced people to death, um, and agreed with James Byrd's killers being sentenced to death. Thank you, my time's expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In congressional hearings, the minority party gets to select its own witnesses. And 
Of all the people that Republicans could have selected, they picked Candace Owens. I don't know Miss Owens. I'm not going to characterize her. I'm going to let her own words do the talking. So I'm going to play for you the first 30 seconds of a statement she made about Adolf Hitler. I agree. I, I actually don't have any problems at all with the word nationalism. I think that it gets, uh, the definition gets poisoned um, by elitists that actually want globalism. Globalism is what I, what I don't want. So when you think about whenever we say nationalism, the first thing people think about, in, at least in America, is Hitler. You know, he was a national socialist, but if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. He wanted to globalize. He wanted everybody to be German, everybody to be speaking German. All right, so my uh, first question is to Ms. Hershenoff. Ms. Owens said, quote, if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. So when people try to legitimize Adolf Hitler, does that feed into white nationalist ideology? It, it does, Mr. Liu. I know that uh, Ms. Owens distanced herself from those comments later, but we expressed great concern over the original comments. Great, thank you. So there's been a lot of talk today. I like to focus on actual policy responses uh, that our government can do to uh, try to mitigate the threat of white nationalism. I know that in my district in Los Angeles just last month, uh, two swastikas were painted at Pan Pacific Park along with the Trail of Blood. I met with Jewish constituents in my district who mentioned that uh, at their synagogues, they've all had to increase security. Uh, as you know, there is a nonprofit security grant program at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, do you believe it'd be worthwhile to increase funding to that program? The ADL has, for establishment reasons, First Amendment reasons, been very cautious and wary of government funding to uh, religious institutions. That being said, we well understand the fear and the safety. So I think that is something that has to be done very carefully in terms of one entanglement. I know in the place where I, in Westchester County where I live, the state and local governments provide a great deal of protection uh, to the synagogue uh, to which I belong. So I do understand, and I would like to work more with Congress, but I want to caution about where we entangle. This is a very difficult thing to do because when we're scared like this, of course we so, want money. So that is a great point you make, and I want to know that this program would apply to mosques as well as synagogues, so it is not specific uh, to the religion. Uh, but uh, it is true, the First Amendment does affect all of these issues, including, for example, private sector companies who say whatever it is uh, that they want. Now, I'd like to also talk about a second um, program, and this was one that I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Clark about, and it has to do with the Trump administration wanting to cut a very specific office called the Community Relations Service Office. Uh, in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. Can you first explain to American people what that office does and uh, why uh, it would be a bad idea to cut funding? The Community Relations Service Office is a very critical um, uh, part of the Justice Department. They are considered the peacemakers. They are the ones who step into communities that are embroiled uh, in the aftermath of a hate incident. Uh, they are the ones who you'd want to deploy out to Louisiana, to the parishes where the churches are burning right now. They're the ones that you'd want on the ground right after the Charlottesville hate rally. We are deeply concerned by proposals to um, cut funding to this office, to shift this um, office to another part um, of the agency. It's important that this agency's work be completely non-political, but the very subject matter of this hearing today underscores the urgency of maintaining this office that has been with us for decades. And in fact, one of the reasons this, this office has worked well is because uh, people who go there and get interviewed, uh, it is not a prosecutorial office, and does that make it easier for people to uh, provide information? That's right. The, they are the peacemakers. They are the ones who go in and connect with communities that are suffering in the aftermath of a hate incident. They connect with um, victims 
uh, of, of crimes and hate crimes and connect them with services. And most importantly, they're the ones who help to uh, ensure that an incident doesn't escalate uh, and lead to more tension. So we need this agency now more than ever. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentleman from North Dakota, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I would uh, yield my time to Mr. Reschenthaler from Pennsylvania. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Owen, uh, Ms. Owens, I'm sorry, we just started a recording. Um, would you like time to respond to that? Yes, um, I think it's pretty apparent that uh, Mr. Liu believes that black people are stupid and will not f uh, pursue the full clip in its entirety. He purposely presented an extract, an extracted witness, clip. The witness absent. will suspend for a moment. It is not proper to refer disparagingly or with, to a member of the committee. Uh, the witness will not do that again. Witness may continue. Sure, even though I was called despicable. Um, witness may not refer to a member of the committee as stupid. I didn't refer to him as stupid. That's not what I said. That's not what I said at all. You, you didn't listen to what I said. May I continue? Please. As I said, he is assuming that black people will not go pursue the full two-hour clip. And he purposefully extracted, he cut off, and you didn't hear the question that was asked of me. He's trying to present as if I was launching a defense of Hitler in Germany, when in fact, the question that was asked of me was pertaining to whether or not I believed that Hitler was a, whether or not I believed in nationalism, and that nationalism was bad. And what I responded to was that I do not believe that we should be characterizing Hitler as a nationalist. He was a homicidal, psychopathic maniac that killed his own people. A nationalist would not kill their own people. That is exactly what I was referring to in the clip, and he purposely wanted to give you a cut up similar to what they do to Donald Trump to create a different narrative. That was unbelievably dishonest, and he did not allow me to respond to it, which is worrisome and should tell you a lot about where people are today in terms of trying to drum up narratives. By the way, I would like to also add that I work for Prager University, which is run by an Orthodox Jew, and a single Democrat showed up to the embassy opening in Jerusalem. I sat on a plane for 18 hours to make sure that I was there. I'm deeply offended by the insinuation of, of revealing that clip without the question that was asked of me. Thanks, Mrs. Owens, and I yield the remainder of my time. Gentleman yields back. The uh, gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking you for calling this hearing today, and I want to um, thank my colleagues and um, the witnesses for engaging seriously with a serious problem. Um, I'm proud also that I'm a member of the House of Representatives that adopted the most comprehensive and forceful denunciation of anti-Semitism in the history of the U.S. Congress on March 7, 2019. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, has uh, repeated the talking point that somehow this was a watered-down resolution because we included other forms of racism and bigotry and hate violence. And I just want to take a second to uh, dissent from that view. Um, the white supremacists and nationalists that we're discussing today hate minorities of almost every particular color, religion, race, character, ethnicity. So how could it conceivably be an effective or comprehensive response to the problem that faces us today to pick out one form of bias and prejudice and to target simply that one? And speaking as a Jewish person, I feel very strongly that the uh, effort to defend Jews against anti-Semitism is integrally linked to the effort to defend African Americans and Hispanics, members of the LGBT community, Muslims, and others against white nationalists, white supremacists, and racial violence. So far from watering the resolution down, we strengthened that resolution. We made it a powerful statement of the values of this institution. Now, um, Ms. Hershenoff, I want to come to you. Um, in 2018, there were thousands of hate crimes across the country, and 50 people in America were murdered by domestic extremists, which marks a 30% increase over the prior year. 49 of the people murdered, or 98%, uh, died at the hands of white nationalists and white supremacists and anti-government extremists, as you have described them. 
Um, in 2017, the FBI documented more than 7,000 hate crimes, which was a sharp increase over just a few years before. And these are crimes that are motivated by racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim bias, and anti-LGBT bias. Now, um, the Anti-Defamation League is involved every single day in the struggle against hate crimes and hate violence. Um, the administration, as I understand it, has made an 84% cut from a program called Combating Violent Extremism. Uh, the budget went from uh, $21 million under the prior administration to $3 million in this administration, slashing the staff from 16 full-time employees to eight or fewer. Um, will you tell us about the Combating Violent Extremism program and what this cut might mean? Thank you. Um, what, what we need and what the ADL wants is preventing violent extremism. Now, I want to acknowledge that there have been criticisms from some of my colleagues in vulnerable communities that, that sometimes in the past that program uh, profiled Muslims. And I want to say something. I want to clar take this moment to clarify from our experts who track violence from those who pervert uh, the Muslim faith. There, faith. There's absolutely anti-Semitism among them, as there is, are, is among all extremists. However, suggesting that this reflects the whole of the Muslim community is inaccurate and strikes fear and perpetuates conspiracies against all co Muslims, which uh, we've seen the results in real life. And you certainly want, would not want to ascribe um, extremist, racist, or terrorist views to particular religions. At that point, we're just headed towards religious Absolutely. warfare, right? So there needs to be much more, you're right, Mr. Raskin, much more in preventing uh, violent extremism, in tracking, and in interrupting that violence. But what I would say, the ADL actually believes that civil society groups, like those that Ms. Patterson and others are, and, 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 and academics, and the academic uh, uh, institutions, are better set situated right now to look at the de-radicalization, where is hate, how do we do it, where's the prevalence, and how do we... Let me stop practice? you there, just because I, I want to get one question into Ms. Patterson. Right. I appreciate that. So one of the groups that lost money was called Life After Hate. They had a $400,000 grant that just got axed. We had a, a big rally against the white supremacists who came to Washington yes. uh, on the one-year anniversary of the Charlottesville murder of Heather Heyer. And... Um, we had people from this group, Life After Hate, they, they took young people who'd gotten into extremist groups because it gave them a sense of belonging. It gave them a sense of membership. Some people are actually racist, anti-Semitic ideologues, and others are confused, unemployed young people who have nowhere to go. And this group is working to get them out of it, Life After Hate. And I wonder wh what you know about Life After Hate and other groups that are actually trying to get young people out of this dead end of white extremist activity. I've the gentleman's read, time has expired. The witness may answer the question. I've read very compelling stories from people who used to be skinheads and white supremacists who figured out this was wrong and they went a different way. And once again, I would say to all members of this committee, but particularly the Republicans, to say to the administrative branch of government, to the executive, please fund these programs. It's nice that you talk about your aversion to white supremacy, but we need some muscle behind it, these programs that you're talking about. I thank the uh, gentleman, the uh, gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Demings. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses uh, here today. It is good. It certainly keeps me on my toes and keeps me very focused to hear all our perspectives. I'm glad today to uh, see my colleagues on the other side of the aisle and hear their great concern today about uh, extremist and racist behavior. Because these behaviors have existed in this country uh, since 1619. And so, Ms. Patterson, thank you for taking us back uh, to the beginning where slaves, maybe we need to be reminded the world is watching were tortured, beaten, raped, hung, children separated from their parents. We've seen that before. Uh, if that's not enough for you, I join my colleague, Mr. Gomer, in remembering a young man who was tied to the back of a truck and was dragged 
until his body was unrecognizable as a human being. I join you, Mr. Goma, in remembering James Byrd. But if that's not enough for you, then let's remember a young student who was pistol whipped, tortured, beaten, and tied to a fence, and left to die, in which he did. Today, we remember a young man by the name of Matthew Shepard. Hateful rhetoric does have consequences, and Dr. We do extend our deepest condolences to you regarding what happened to or your family. One of my colleagues today said that nothing that white nationalists claim resonates with any of us here today. Well, if that be true, then you all would denounce hate at all times and not just wait until things are said that you don't like about a particular group or wait until a time when it's politically advantageous. I do believe that in this country, we're better than that. And let me remind my colleagues, because we're the ones with the authority and the power to make the decisions. Uh, it took my Republican colleagues over a decade to take any action against one of their own who had a reputation of making disparaging remarks. But what are we going to do about it? Because you know, there is hope. We do have an opportunity to move forward. And I'd like to direct my questions to Mr. Potts and Ms. Walton with regard to your platforms being used to spread hate and possibly violence. The hateful rhetoric comes first, it seems, and then the action comes to follow it. Groups including the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, Civil Human Rights and Color of Change have called for civil rights audits of tax companies after repeated failures to effectively and timely, timely remove violent content, particularly relating to uh, hate crimes. We've heard about New Zealand, so I don't need to talk about that. Uh, would your companies be willing to submit to an external audit from academics and other external stakeholders and I'd like to know why or why not. And Mr. Potts, we'll start with you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, currently, we, are, we have employed Laura Murphy, one of the leading civil rights, both leaders, uh, civil liberties leaders uh, in America to do a civil rights audit. Uh, she actually published her first uh, set of findings in January of this year, and she'll continue to uh, examine our processes, our policies, and the uh, room for unintentional uh, bias that may creep into our system. And then I assume that she'll also make those public. Uh, obviously, we give uh, Ms. Murphy a lot of space to do her audit. Um, she'll conduct that in a deliberate way. So you've uh, already to agreed it. to make those uh, results public. And some of those results are currently public right now. Thank you very much for that, because it is about getting better, isn't it? It really is. A absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Walden. Thank you. Uh, we didn't receive a similar request to do an audit. However, we work very closely with organizations like the Leadership Conference, <coughs> like Lawyers Committee, like ADL, uh, Muslim Public Affairs Council, et cetera. Um, we're part of ADL's Cyber Hate Problem Solving Lab, and so we work very closely with organizations to ensure that their work informs the way that we think about these Would issues. Would you be willing to submit to an audit? We undergo audits under the European Code of Conduct on hate speech already, um, so that is certainly something we've made public and I think are willing to do so. So it's something you're willing to take a look at Absolutely. doing. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, Ms. Scanlon of Pennsylvania. Thank you very much. Um, you know, Today's hearing comes at a time when uh, incidents of hate and violence are increasing at an alarming rate. And as I'm sitting here listening to the testimony today, I'm thinking about the impact just in my own district. I mean, in, in October, I attended services at our local temple after the Squirrel Hill incident and, um, you know, had to pass the police cars passed out, parked outside to protect the temple. And just a couple weeks ago, I went to our local mosque in Upper Darby to meet with our, our Muslim neighbors there after the shooting in New Zealand and had to pass, you know, the police cars there. On Sunday, I was in um, Charleston with family for a family event 
and took the opportunity to attend services at Mother Emanuel, as I had two years previously. And I did have some consolation while I was there in knowing that just a few weeks ago, um, this committee held hearings on gun violence and the House passed the Charleston loophole bill, which would have denied a gun to the white supremacist who murdered people at Mother Emanuel. So we have made a little bit of progress, but we are far, far from being through. And, and just the fact that we hear that, you know, white nationalists are fundraising off this hearing today by uh, live streaming it is, is really, really troubling. Um, Ms. Clark, can you speak to what more the Justice Department could be doing in this space? Um, thank you for that question. We've talked a lot about um, hate crimes and the need for the Justice Department to bring more resources to bear investigating and prosecuting the perpetrators. But I want to make sure that before we close out this hearing, we also talk about the impact of hate on children. We know that there uh, has been a 25% increase in hate incidents. Um, in the K to 12 context. And again, this is a place where the Justice Department has resources at its disposal to make sure that our schools are safe environments, safe learning environments for all kids, regardless of race. We're also seeing hate play out in the workplace. And here too, the Justice Department can play a role in stamping out the hate that um, African Americans, uh, Muslims, and other minorities are experiencing in the workplace. We need a Justice Department that is willing to roll up its sleeves and bring every resource to bear on combating this crisis. We know through our own work at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law that law enforcement agencies on the ground are often ill-equipped and under resources and not prepared uh, to confront hate. So making sure that the Justice Department is stepping in to provide support to bring perpetrators to justice, thinking about hate and how it's playing out in schools and at workplaces is also critical. And then finally, um, data collection is so key. We know that there are um, a lot of hate crimes that go underreported, but more importantly, a lot of law enforcement agencies fail to report data uh, to the federal level as they are required to. Finding ways to incentivize better data collection and de uh, better data reporting is also crucial in the war against hate. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Ms. Arshinov, you know, we've seen a little bit of this even today where um, minority groups are being pitted against one another. And, and I don't want to let the white supremacists, you know, do, I don't want to do their work for them by pitting people against each other. So the ADL has been pretty vocal that there's no evidence that the hate crimes in the U.S. against Jewish people are being committed by Muslims and vice versa, that hate crimes against Muslims in the U.S. are being perpetrated by Jewish people. Can you um, speak to what your research shows and how white supremacists are using the strategy of pitting Jews and Muslims against each other to drum up divisive rhetoric and a false narrative about who's committing domestic terrorism here in the U.S.? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Representative Scanlon, I think you've brought up again the need to look at the data and to be very transparent about it so everyone else can look at it and make sure, because it is true that what we, we are not seeing Muslims in the United States attacking Jews or vice versa. And when we, I, I, you know, in a democratic pluralist society like the United States should be and is meant to be, if we don't join in coalition and have each other's backs, no minority is safe. And the only winners are those who sow division and try to divide us, whether that's for whether that's for white supremacist agendas, whether that's either Democrats or Republicans using it for political gain, uh, whatever that is, who wins? I don't want to be the Jewish people or any people to be a prop for that. And I thank both the, you know, Mr. Raskin and uh, the GOP senators who have, who have uh, made these comments and, and uh, invade against and st made statements against hate. Don't use us as props. You know, that, that, that's what's happening. It's a divide and conquer. And who really wins then? The haters win. Thank you. The time of the gentlelady has expired. Uh, Ms. Garcia of Texas. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I, too, want to thank you for having this uh, hearing on this very important topic. I know that for me and my district, um, it is 
uh, are overwhelmingly Latino, we are seeing uh, more incidents occur uh, that we believe to be uh, hate crimes. Uh, I have today, uh, Mr. Chairman, the written testimony of the late David Richardson, a Houston area resident, who testified in front of this committee on April 17, 2007, about his experience as a hate crime survivor. Mr. Richardson was viciously attacked by two individuals targeted for being Mexican-American. His attackers, one an admitted racist skinhead, attempted to carve a swatska on his chest. Richardson was brutally beat to a pulp, burned with cigarettes, and left for dead. Richardson woke up in the hospital weeks later, his life changed forever. The former Klein Collins High School running back and homecoming prince spent three months in the hospital and endured more than 30 surgeries. Incredibly, the assailants had no specific liability under federal law for the hate crimes committed. Mr. Richardson gave his testimony in this very committee while advocating for the Local Law Enforcement Hate Crimes Prevention Act of 2007, which expanded the ability to prosecute hate crimes. President Obama signed a version of that bill into law in 2009, but sadly, Richardson would not live to see the fruits of his courage in speaking out against hate as a survivor. At 18 years old, Richardson committed suicide a mere three weeks, mere weeks after testifying here. Today's dialogue is important as we examine the ways in which harmful rhetoric and policies of the national stage have involved in hate. And I want to start my questions with you, Ms. Um, Herbersong. You know, as, as one of my colleagues said, we're not trying to compete here, but the truth is that there is a rise in crime against, uh, hate crimes against uh, immigrants, particularly. I think you quoted the, the, um, uh, the rhetoric of, of um, the New Zealand shooter uh, who said that we needed to, to stop the invaders. Uh, how, how alarming is the increase? Is it acute? In other words, if you compare trends, if you look at your data, is it, is it just critically uh, increasing in terms of crimes against immigrants or Latinos? Yes, there is a, a slight increase. I think if you look at the FBI uh, data, which is from 2017, um, you see that uh, there's a, all of this has, has uh, risen. Um, Jews up 37%, religion 27%, ethnicity up, uh, attacks against immigrants and refugees up, so yes. It is, and you know, I must say, I wanna direct my questions now to the representatives from Facebook and Google. You've not made me feel any better. I mean, I just don't feel any sense of reassurance in your presentations and your demeanor in terms of what we're doing to, to respond to uh, a lot of the messaging that is on social media, not just Facebook and, and, um, and Google, but also through Twitter, through uh, Amazon, through, through YouTube, through all of it. And you all are both globally, what have you done to, to ensure that, that all your folks out there globally know the dog whistles, that know the, the key words, the, the phrasing, you know, the, the, the things that people respond to, to ensure that, that we, can, we can stop some of this and be more proactive in blocking some of this language. Congresswoman, thank you for the question. That is exactly one of the things that we are constantly thinking about. It's true that those who seek to exploit our platforms are uniquely motivated and um, their tactics are ever evolving. Um, that's why we have, internally, we have an Intel desk that looks to see and track trends of what we're seeing um, on our platform, but also we engage with external experts so that we can understand what others are seeing. Um, as language changes, it's important for us to be able to understand things like you said, like dog whistles, um, so that we know when slurs are happening as part of comments or in videos that our, that our reviewers are um, reviewing. And our global, oh. Mr. Potts. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, we do have 30,000 people now focused on safety and security, and within that 30,000 people, we have specific subject matter experts that focus on this area. Uh, so we have academics, we have other, uh, that other people who come from civil society, human rights backgrounds, to really dive deep in this area. We do use a lot of our, excuse me, our automation and artificial intelligence to help surface, to help provide that data analysis. 
Uh, and then the other key part is the partnerships. Uh, so working um, not only just across industry, but with civil society, working with external groups, working with academia to get ahead of those trends so we see those signals. And then we try to write policies that can actually get and target that, and then we can remove it from the, from the platform. Well, I hope you do more. Thank you. Time is We're expired. Time. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate it very much, uh, and I appreciate that we're having this important hearing. I did want to say, just before I get to my questions, that the, the ranking member talked about the need to call out hate and stop playing to 15 minutes of fame, I think is the way it was phrased. And I, I do have to wonder then why the minority called uh, some witnesses who have, in fact, actually traded in just this. And I think it is not that um, we want to... Would the gentleman uh, yield for just half a second? Not, not right at this okay. moment, but I, I, I will it. at the end. Um, my I, my, my right. concern about the characterization oh. of some of what's happened is that we have a mass murderer who really did trade in hate, 50 counts of murder, 39 attempted murder counts, who did call out one of the witnesses on this panel as being his inspiration. Whether or not she was, I'm not contending. I'm not contesting that. But I think that for people across the country who are watching this hearing, the idea that somehow we would give any legitimacy to speech that in any way might be considered as triggering that kind of action, that's different than saying somebody is responsible, which I would never say. But I do think that it is uh, deeply hurtful for people across this country who might be watching this to see some of those things expressed or given legitimacy to. And I, I just want to say that I think that that's an important consideration. And we've gotten a lot of emails about this. And uh, I know there were many things that were entered into the record. I also ask unanimous consent, Madam Chair, to enter into the record a statement from the Western State Center and a statement that was sent by a num number of uh, Masa gr groups, Muslim, Arab, South Asian groups. Uh, I ask unanimous Without consent. Without objection. Thank you. So um, let me go to my questions now. And my first question is for Mr. Potts. Uh, following the tragic hate crime in New Zealand, Facebook did ban explicit praise, support, or representation of white nationalism and white separatism on Facebook and Instagram. And in my opinion, this change was long overdue. It probably should have been done a long time ago, given the evidence that you had following Heather Heyer's death in 2000, uh, at the 2017 white supremacist rally. So what are you doing now that you have put this into place to ensure that the ban is fully enforced? Thank you, Congresswoman. And obviously condolences to uh, Ms. Hayer's family. Uh, those tragic events uh, still ring uh, very strong to my mind as a graduate of the uh, School of Law at the University of Virginia. Uh, just to, to be clear, on the policy again, banning white nationalism, white separatism, we have been looking at it for uh, a fairly long time. We started the process in September to really examine, can we move forward uh, to find the linkage to organized violence, organized hate uh, from those terms. We met with a wide range of groups globally, uh, North America, Europe, Africa, elsewhere. Uh, to really focus in to see what those groups would say across the spectrum. Mr. Potts, I'm, I'm so sorry. I don't want to cut you off, but uh, I have I'm, very I'm, little time. And I just wanted to see if you could address the fact that there are still white nationalist I, pages I, on your site. And, and I appreciate the process. No, I, I, I fully, I'm sorry, Congresswoman. Um, when we become aware of these pages, we will remove them. Uh, we do uh, do that through a variety of ways, both reactively. When someone reports that to us, we will remove those pages if they violate our terms. We also are doing some proactive surfacing of those to human reviewers so that they can also review at that time and remove. So it's a full, fully holistic approach that we take. We try to uh, really leverage our technology in that space and we're hoping to get faster. Thank you. And, and civil rights organizations have asked you specifically for greater transparency on your enforcement practices and training. Uh, can you commit to sharing your enforcement practices and training procedures with the public? Congressman, uh, first, again, uh, protecting civil rights is something that's core to us at Facebook, something that's very personal to me, something that we really want to lean into. If, if, you, if you can't, you know, if you're concerned about privacy issues, will you at least commit to sharing it with Congress and uh, with stakeholders as soon as possible? As I uh, 
as uh, Ms. Murphy, uh, Laura Murphy is doing her assessment. I'm sure that is also going to be part of the assessment. And is that a yes or define, is that a yes or no? Uh, if we are able, would to you our, share your enforcement practices with Congress so that we can make sure that there is enforcement around? If we are able to share them, uh, I, I can commit to that. I, I don't know the process. Okay, how about you, Ms. Walden? Can you give me a clear yes? Yes, we make all of our enforcement, we have a transparency report about our enforcement guidelines and we already demonstrate sort of what we're doing with machine learning, what is done with community flagging and what's done on hate specifically. There you go, okay. So does your enforcement policy include a trusted flagger program for vetted respected civil and human rights organizations to expedite review of potential hateful activities? Congresswoman, we do have partnerships with a number of organizations, including some civil rights organizations where they have that. And I th just, I th a, just a yes or no. I think I misunderstood your other question about the uh, enforcement. Uh, we do share a community standards enforcement report that is transparent. We do that twice a year. Um, so I apologize for uh, misunderstanding. Okay. I know the gentlelady's time, but do you still give me a moment? Uh, if, if the chair will. A great, a, a, a great. I, th I think I, I, I just want to make sure I can reclaim my time. If, if I'm there, there's not, it all I want to simply say is it's, it's been brought up in my time, and it was specifically, and you can go back to my question to Mr. Potts, was concerning those who are and live streaming uh, violence such as the act that was in New Zealand. That was the context. I have not, and every one of this member of this body takes their own five minute YouTube moments. So those times of fame, we understand. I was not talking about that and never was talking about that. My specific request was a discussion on the New Zealand, how we could actually take those away from them because that is what they seek. That was all I intended to and to claim anything else is less than, you know, what was No, thank said. you. I, I was not disagreeing with you, Mr. Collins. I actually agreed with your statement. I just wondered why the minority invited witnesses that clearly have some very controversial pieces in their background, in, including one who was seen to be the biggest influence on the white supremacist who slaughtered 49 worshipers in his words. This is not saying that you believe this, but in his words. So, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlelady yields back. The gentle, gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBath. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a survivor of a hate crime myself, I want to begin by reading a statement from two of the survivors of one of the horrific acts of hatred that took the lives of American 11 Americans last year, quote, on October 27th, 2018, an individual fueled by white national, nationalist hatred entered the Tree of Life Synagogue, murdered 11 innocent people, and seriously wounded two community members and four of our dedicated Pittsburgh police officers. We are survivors of that violent act of extremist hate. We do not want others to have to endure what we and our community have had to endure. We therefore urge you to take the measures necessary to combat this rising tide of hate and violence. Make sure that our law enforcement agencies are organized and have the resources to monitor and combat this threat. Adopt simple common sense measures to keep dangerous weapons out of the wrong hands. Thank you so much for listening to us and thank you for all of your efforts on behalf of our country. Sincerely, Martin Gaynor and Daniel Legger, end quote. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous, unanimous consent that this full statement be Without added objection. to the record. Thank you. Dr. Abusala, like Mr. Gaynor and Mr. Legger, you and I are survivors. Each of us has lost loved ones because of the deadly combination of prejudice and a firearm, whether that hatred was directed toward a black son, Muslim daughters, or Jewish congregation. As we work to remember the people who have been taken from us, we are constantly reminded of the bigotry that claims more lives every single day. Hatred has already made survivors out of so many of us, and there will be more survivors every day that that hatred and that white supremacy is allowed to persist. Dr. Abusala, in your view, please tell me what resources are needed for the rising numbers of survivors of hate crimes, both immediately after an incident and in the months and years afterward. Uh, thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, so I want to point out that mo many American states don't have hate crime laws. The great state of North Carolina, where I come from, has an ethnic intimidation law in place, which I cannot really understand or explain. So first of all, we have to have hate crime laws in every state. Number two, I think we need to revisit the definition of hate crime, because it's really insufficient for us to ask that to prove it's a hate crime, the criminal had to declare why he's killing the victim. And the, I, I refer to uh, a professor of criminology at uh, 
Northeastern University, uh, Jack McLewitt, who defined Hicks crime as a hate crime because number one, the given cause for the crime was trivial to the atrocity of the crime. And number two, he did pick and choose a target for his hate of religion that is the most vulnerable religion. And since I have an opportunity to speak, I would like to go back to Mr. Klein's question and emphasize that um, I was trained in medical school by Jewish professors. I have Jewish friends. My son has best friends who are Jewish. The Jewish community came to our rescue and we had an interfaith night after the New Zealand massacre. But I find it troubling that Mr. Klein turned this conversation into an almost an Islamophobic conversation where I'm talking about my tragedy and my loss as a Muslim. And he calls me again uh, on that. And also mixing the concept of what is a Jewish American versus an Israeli citizen. We're not here to discuss foreign policy. And Mr. Klein mixed foreign policy with our discussion today too much, way too much. I find myself as a, an Amer a Muslim American, um, hold on to my freedom and my privacy of thought. and I don't have to give any pledge of allegiance to any foreign power to prove my case. Okay. Thank you very much. Ms. Clark, how can the government support communities targeted by intolerance, whether they have faced a particular incident of violence, threats of violence, or hate of speech, or hate speech, rather? Well, it, we know that hate crimes are on the rise. We also know that a tremendous number of hate incidents go underreported. I think it's important that law, uh, law enforcement demonstrate a real commitment st to standing up and providing support for victims when hate incidents happen. I think it's critical that they work with prosecutors to make sure that perpetrators are held accountable. And most importantly, I think it's important that they speak up and use their voice to condemn these incidents when they happen, because the silence can be truly deafening. Thank you. Now you back the remainder of my time. Thank the gentlelady. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagus, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, in particular, uh, Dr. Abu Saleh, thank you uh, for your testimony and your courage, uh, and my condolences to you for your loss. Uh, today's hearing comes at a crucial time when too many people in this country feel unwelcome, unsafe, and marginalized. We cannot allow for hate to be normalized in our nation, and we cannot sit idly by. The, this divisive rhetoric that continues to pervade our national conversation demands a discussion and demands action. The Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism has reported that 71 percent of the extremist-related fatalities in the United States between 2008 and 2017 were committed by members of the far-right or white supremacist movements. The rise of white supremacy and hate speech has only been further perpetrated by the use of online platforms. After the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand, a video, as we all know, was shared countless times through online platforms that live-streamed the massacre of 50 people. We need a solution, and one will only come with the government working hand-in-hand -hand with the online platforms who, that continue to be used by individuals to push a hateful agenda. And so with that, uh, Mr. Potts, my questions are for you. First, thank you for being here, and thank you for your service to our country. Uh, I appreciate the first steps that online platforms such as um, Facebook have taken to attempt the curb. The use of their platforms as a base for white nationalists, including your company's recent decision to explicitly ban all forms of white nationalist separatist content. Um, but uh, similar to uh, Representative uh, Jayapal, I'd, I'd like to, I think, dig a little deeper in terms of how the policy is working in practice, obviously understanding that it's only been uh, in existence for the better part of a week and a half, I suppose. But um, if you could give us some further details, I guess, for first starting out, my understanding is the pages you are screening, you're using a series of algorithms, right, day, on a daily basis to screen pages that would violate your new norms or you know, uh, con standards of conduct? Uh, thank you, Congressman. We use a series of both uh, artificial intelligence and human reviewers uh, to do uh, what we would call proactive sweeping uh, for that type of content. Uh, we use signals uh, from our community, uh, user reports, uh, to help uh, us really hone in onto what may be uh, white nationalist or white separatist uh, behavior. Uh, if we do find known white nationalists or known white separatists or people who are affiliated with hate organizations, we actually have a process where we conduct what we call a fan out. And a fan out is to look at their, that person's connections to ensure that we are trying to get to the root of those networks and to remove them from the platform. On balance, thank you for that answer. On balance, what would the percentage be of the content that is shared that is sort of triggered, in these al triggered by these algorithms or by the AI tools that you use that would be posted or created by fake accounts? 
Congressman, I don't have that number, but I'm happy to follow up. I, I can uh, try to uh, do some research, but I don't think we have that uh, fidelity in a number right now. Okay. Um, it would be very helpful to, to have that data, because I think it'd be quite informative in terms of the steps that perhaps you all would continue to take or perhaps new steps that, that might be necessary. And, and here's why I'm asking. Um, the, the ADL, um, Ms. Hirschnoff, uh, your organization prepared a study last year that following the horrific shooting at the Pittsburgh synagogue, um, you analyzed, or the ADL rather analyzed 7.5 million Twitter messages, so this is not related to Facebook, um, between August 13th, August 31st and September 17th, about two weeks, and found that almost 30% of the accounts repeatedly tweeting um, hatred, hate, hateful messages, um, that those appeared to be bots. And I, I don't know if you have that data with you, but I suppose that you could confirm that that was the case. But It's of uh, uh, 4.2 million tweets, 40% were bots. 40%. So given that, um, I, I guess I am curious, Mr. Potts, if internally in Facebook you've had conversations around how to deal with the proliferation of those, those fake accounts. Right? My understanding is last year alone, Facebook disabled 1.3 billion fake accounts. And so to the extent, that's why the, the data around the posts, you know, percentages of the, the content, content that's um, being flagged by your algorithm that is produced by fake bots, the reason why that data is so important is because to the extent that it mirrors some of the data we've seen in other uh, mediums, I would think that rather than being reactive, right, that there would be a case to be made to addressing it at the source, and that is to say addressing the proliferation of those fake accounts. If you'd care to comment. That, that, is, that is correct, Congressman. We do have a very strong coordinated and authentic behavior a policy that is meant to go after networks of fake accounts when they are used to uh, mislead who they are and mislead what they're doing. So if they, those accounts may include white nationalism and white separatism content, may include other things, may be financially motivated, but we do remove those, uh, those networks uh, forcefully. I believe we are well into the double digits now and we continue to uh, act on, on that policy today. And I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank the gentleman, uh, the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this uh, important hearing. Uh, I'm not interested in sort of the false discussion over whether or not white supremacy exists in America or around the world. Uh, it does, we know it does, and we know it costs lives. Um, I'd like to lift up Dr. Abu Salhala, your testimony. I'm sorry for your crushing uh, unimaginable loss. Thank I bring back these beautiful photographs of these beautiful children, your children, I would argue our children. Uh, and I thank you for telling the terrible story of their deaths. Mm -hmm. But what I'm more impressed with is the story of their lives and how you carry that story and you repeat that story because I'm confident I was thinking here throughout this testimony, how do we prevent further acts of terrorism based on bigotry and hatred and the notions of white supremacy? And the way we do that is to lift up stories of love. That's what you did. That's what you do as you sit here. And it is more important than I think any policy decision we can make, though I'm certain we have policy decisions to make. So I, I, I did want to just say that to you, and if I want to open it to you just for a moment for anything further you wanted to say, but again, thank you. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. I, I appreciate that, and, and we are proud of them. And if anything maintains us and helps us survive is their legacy, and their endowment is in excess of a million dollar now for fighting bias and charity. Uh, uh, you can visit our three winners.org uh, and look at that. Um, Fighting terrorism has been the top of the agenda of Muslim Americans. And I think fighting terrorism rests in practicing our constitution and our freedoms and our rights as Muslim Americans and other Americans all together. Because when you single out any group, whether Jewish or Christian or black or Muslim, you make them more vulnerable to that radicalization. So I think fighting terrorism is something we all agree about in this country. I, I thank you for that, and, and I will take a look at your programs and that marvelous endowment, uh, and that it is obviously an endowment of love. You could sit here and you could be filled with hatred, and instead you choose not to be. 
and you don't make sweeping statements about all Democrats this or all Democrats that. So uh, I absolutely thank you. not. I, I thank you for that. Um, I wanted to talk also, uh, Ms. Clark, about rhetoric. In my past life, I taught writing and rhetoric and ethics at a university in Philadelphia. Uh, and so I really care about language and what we say as much as we need to be talking policy. But I want to find out from you what you think the testimony today or, or the testimony literally that we hear from this administration uh, through its words and its actions, uh, what does that reveal and, and how does it impact what we're doing? Um, how does it impact the national climate? Because words matter, but how can we make that tangible for folks? Right. What we've seen with this administration is that words, um, the rhetoric, the policy actions matter. And they're influencing how people think about and interact with fellow citizens who may be of a different race or a different religion. Um, at every turn with this administration, we've seen policy actions that make clear that people of color have a target on their back whether you're talking about the Muslim ban, whether you're talking about the separation of brown children from their parents at the border, uh, whether you're talking about the assault being waged on affirmative action by this uh, Justice Department. Um, we're seeing the dehumanization of African-American and Muslims and other uh, communities of color. And um, where I think we've seen the ugliest impact is on our kids, frankly on children who are learning and internalizing hate because of uh, so much of what's happening at the federal level. I'm um, deeply concerned about the, the rise in hate crimes that we're seeing at schools. We've seen about a 25% uptick in hate incidents at schools. And I think it's gonna take a lot of work to not only push back against the crisis that we face, but to undo the damage and to reprogram children who've been harmed by what they've internalized. I am certain that education is going to be the key and our, our way out of this. And Mr. Mr. Potts, real quickly, a more technical question, and thank you all for your testimony today. Uh, I wanna to quickly follow up with a question that my colleague, Mr. Cicilline, uh asked. You said you took Faith Goldie's video and page down yesterday over a week after it was reported, but what specific proactive steps, um, not just responding, to flag content are you taking? Specific proactive steps. The gentlelady's time has expired. The witness may answer the question. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, again, the white nationalism and white separatism policy were just uh, announced uh, about a week and a half ago. So they're just going into enforcement. But in the, <clears throat> within that policy, we are doing both uh, proactive work uh, with our artificial intelligence to surface content that may be violating to get it in front of human reviewers, and then also using our human reviewers on reactive work uh, when it is user reported. So for groups like uh, Miss, uh, uh, this woman whose name has just slipped my mind, uh, we, f we found out via the user report, we then reviewed her against her policies, and then we were able to remove her and then consider her to be a white nationalist. And I just would comment that it seems to me kind of late to just be coming to that notion that a week and a half ago you just came up with these ideas and policies. Uh, this is uh, social media and your uh, important platform and so widely used platform, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that that policy is that new. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. The gentleman from California, Mr. Correa. Thank you, Mr. Chair Chairman. Thank you very much for holding this most important hearing to address the issue of hate crimes and how to prevent them and the rise of white nationalism. Back home in Orange County, California, we're not immune. We've also seen a sharp rise and increase of hate crimes and race-related incidents in the last few years. And those are just the crimes that are actually reported. Um, as we know, two years ago in Charlottesville, Virginia, a self-professed neo-Nazi uh, attacked a crowd of people, resulting in a young woman, woman's death and injury of 19 individuals. After that attack, I called the Homeland Security Committee to hold a hearing to address hate crimes and the rise of white nationalism. I got nothing. Last October, a man shouting anti-Semitic slurs opened fire inside the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. It was the deadliest attack against the Jewish community in the United States in our history. The day after that attack, I again called for a hearing on domestic terrorism and white nationalism. I got nothing. So today, Chairman Ladler, I applaud your leadership on holding this most important hearing. The two terrorist attacks that I mentioned are not the only one, hate crimes in the last few years. Let's not forget about Charleston's historic Emmanuel 
AME Church, the Sikh Temple in Wisconsin, and other attacks. And just yesterday, just yesterday, the family of Army Lieutenant Richard Collins III shared their painful experience of domestic terrorism in my office. The family told me a story. Their constituents from uh, Steny Hoyer's district, their son, who had recently been commissioned, May 2017, was killed, stabbed in the heart by an individual inspired by white supremacist material. Here's a picture of Richard Collins, young man, ready to port to the Army. Two weeks after graduating from Army ROTC, College Army ROTC, stabbed in the heart while waiting for a bus. In the name of all these victims, trying to prevent them in the future, I have a lot of questions, but uh, Ms. Hershov and Dr. Abu Salaba, I would ask you again, when our political leaders echo white supremacist, white nationalist ideas, does that inspire violence in our streets? Um, honestly, it does. Uh, if you are in power, if you're in charge, you're a role model. You represent your country. Um, I don't want to name any names, but um, I'm not a politician, so I don't really follow the details of everything in D.C., but it would be inspiring for our leaders to be uniting and um, fair and calculated when they talk about um, sensitive issues and reinforce unity and solidarity of all Americans. We are the most diverse country in the world. And if our leaders do not practice that genuinely, we're in a dark path. That's all I can say. Ms. Clark, following up on that comment about diversity, my district, I consider it to be the new Ellis Island of the United States, Central Orange County. We have people from all over the world, immigrants from all over the world, refugees. A lot of those kids in those schools are very nervous, very stressed out, very scared. What do I tell them? That we've done them a grave injustice and that we as adults need to do better, that we need to expect more from our national leaders, that no student deserves to go to a school where the N-word is scrawled on the wall or swastikas are found in bathrooms, where KKK flyers are distributed uh, to students. These are all things that we're seeing right now play out at, 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 inside of our nation's schools. Um, we need law enforcement to do better, and we need our leaders to reject policies that dehumanize uh, stu students of color, communities of color, and most importantly, we, we need to all condemn the hate that's playing out across our country right now. Ms. Clark, I think what you're trying to say is that we have to remember what America is all about. That's right. A country of immigrants, a country of folks that have been re rejected by their home countries and come to America and have made this country the greatest country in the world. Right. We have to remind our children of our heritage. That's right. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Thank the gentleman, the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. McCarsell Powell is recognized. Uh, thank you. And just to reiterate, as we close this hearing today, I think it's important to, for all of us to remember why we're here. And we are here to deal with the rise of white nationalism, to deal with the rise of violent, hateful crimes. And I truly um, respect Mr. Abu Salah for coming here and honor your children from that hateful incident back in 2015. Ms. Eileen Hershenoff, and can you just describe very briefly so that everybody understands in the simplest form, what is nas white nationalism? White nationalism is one of the many euphemisms for white supremacy. The core ideology of white supremacy now used to be before the civil rights movement to be to re, uh, keep the dominance of the white race. Now it's fear of the imminent genocide of the white race by a flood of non-whites and other people whom they consider degenerates, which they say are, uh, that flood is orchestrated by Jews as parasitic puppeteers. So thank you. You know, I'm an immigrant from Ecuador. 
So would white nationalists perceive me as a threat? As an immigrant, as somebody from a, uh, as a Latina, a Latinx, uh, yes, uh, that is the dominant ideology. And my husband is Jewish. Would he be perceived as a threat? He would be perceived as some omnipotent, parasitic force, uh, loyal only to his own race, and a, a threat to the white race. And my children who were born in this incredible nation, but whose parents are a mix of Latino and Jewish, would they be perceived as a threat? Yes, uh, what they consider mis miscegenation, whether that is African-American and white or something else, uh, they would be. And as having parents, both of whom are from communities that they demean and dehumanize, yes, they would. And have you heard of the group, the Proud Boys? Yes. Okay. I was a victim of an act of hate from the Proud Boys a few months ago. I was uh, visiting the office of one of my now colleagues, Representative Donna Shalala, in Miami. The chairman of the Miami Republican Party, along with the Proud Boys, organized a hate rally where we had to be placed in lockdown because they were banging at the doors, screaming profanities that I can't repeat in public. And we had to call the law enforcement officers. We had to wait there for a few hours. It was definitely um, a very threatening and fearful experience for me. And one of the first times that I actually experienced it firsthand, uh, at what we're dealing with in this country, thankfully, nothing happened to any of us. Thankfully, law enforcement came right away. What do you think the consequence should be to these type of groups? Um, I think that the laws, the, the kind of tracking and the laws on the book, as Dr. Abu Saleh said, are, need to be enhanced. Um, there's a number of different things. Ms. Clark has talked about education, but, uh, and I know there's federal legislation to enhance uh, uh, hate, cr uh, hate crime laws. In the, a lot of uh, crimes are state laws, and a lot of this starts online with real life consequences, and no state has an anti-doxing law. Very few have anti-stalking or anti-swatting. So we need hate crime online and enhanced hate crime laws. I, I agree fully because I can tell you that it was through Facebook that they got this rally organized. Um, and I can tell you also that I have done my research and there's still videos from the Proud Boys that are still trending online through various forms, one of them YouTube. And so Ms. Clark, just to finish off, Facebook has said that they remove white supremacist content as soon as they're aware of it. From the Lawyers Committee's experience, is that accurate? We're uh, very pleased that after many months, Facebook abandoned this ill-conceived and flawed policy of giving white, separate, su white supremacist activity the okay and, um, uh, or, or banning white supremacist activity but giving white nationalists and white separatist um, activity the, the red light. Um, I will say that for several months, we've flagged pages like the Nationalist Agenda page on Facebook, and it's okay to be white. And these are pages that are still up today as this hearing is taking place. We realize that it, uh, the hard work lies ahead as Facebook implements this policy, but no doubt tech companies must step up uh, if we're going to ever uh, combat the hate crime crisis today, because online hate is so pervasive and widespread. Yes, and as Ms. Walden stated earlier, she was uh, concerned of aggressive oversight. I think that we have to work together as Congress members, as heads of companies that are actually spreading this. I know it's extremely difficult to control, but we have to do better than this because we can't allow this hateful rhetoric to spread. Thank you so much. The gentlelady from uh, Florida for unanimous consent request. Uh, from Texas, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to put uh, three articles in the record uh, the first one, three black churches have burned in 10 days in a single Louisiana parish, as unanimous consent. Um, hate crimes increase for the third consecutive year, FBI reports. And then counties that hosted a 2016 Trump rally 
saw a 226% increase in hate crimes. I ask unanimous consent to put those items into the record, which is a reflection of uh, without, this hearing. Without objection, the items will be entered into the record. This concludes today's hearing. Thank you to our distinguished witnesses for attending. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written, written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. The hearing is adjourned. Well, Mr. Chairman, there are 21 Democrats missing and 16, 15 Republicans. That